All right, a big congratulations to all of you who have made it this far into the course. Uh, I have essentially completed every topic that I wanted to cover in depth and as sort of a more of a lecture based um, section of the course. And uh, we are heading into our last section of the course here. And this section is going to be more demonstration based. And I'm just going to go about finishing up this level. So, you know, replacing these columns with something more permanent and some of these assets as well. So um, this this section of the course is totally optional. You have all the skills you need to do this yourself already, uh, but I'm going to demonstrate how to do it uh, for those of you who may just be interested to see my workflows. So without further ado, let's get started. I think the first thing I'm going to do, looking at what needs to be done, I mean, a lot needs to be done, but um, for me, I think the easiest thing to tackle would be these sort of floor catwalks because we can still use these uh, brick textures that we made in a previous part of the course. And as long as we uh, create a new asset here and UV unwrap it properly, we can get this texture working on this piece. So um, that's what I'm going to start with, I think. So um, I'm just pulling up on my second screen my file browser here. And I'm going to pull up my wall tile blender file. So this is where we left off. We had our texture that we made in this blender file and I did apply it to a column and I brought that column in, I think in room one. Yeah, so in room one, I have a single column here. And I mean, we we can go in and replace all of these. However, I just think that I might want to create a different texture for these columns because it's getting a little bit monochromatic in here with the same tiling texture repeating across the whole room. I mean, we can we can just test it to see how it looks though. That doesn't hurt. I'm going to uh, ma maximize my screen space here. It's OK. Um, again, this is maybe more like a version one sort of uh, texture to have in, in place of just the bright, bright purple. Um, and it certainly doesn't hurt to have that be done in version one and then maybe come in and make a different uh, column texture. And you can even have a, a few different variations on the column, like maybe we have one here that has a wider base um, and, and then we keep these narrow ones, these uniform ones for when they need to extend down or something to that effect. Um, but anyway, I'm getting distracted already. What I'm going to do here is replace these pieces here with something more permanent. So uh, these floors are one by four. So one meter width, four meter length pieces. So, and then I believe they are 10 centimeters uh, high as well. So that is easy enough to make in Blender. Let's open our wall file here. And I'm just gonna move this guy over to the side a little bit. And let's in Blender here, we don't need the texture up. Let's add a new cube, mesh cube. And let's just give it those dimensions we just talked about. So it's going to be one meter wide. It's going to be four meters long and it's going to be 10 centimeters thick. So that is about right. So let's apply our scale here. Scale, control A, apply scale. And uh, we can pop over to our UV editing window. And um, because this is such a simplistic mesh, I can just mark every single edge as a seam here, which is what I want to do. So I am just going to right click in edge select mode and with everything selected, mark it as a seam. Uh, and then as long as you have your scale applied, when you hit U to unwrap it, it should unwrap at the correct scale. Let's put our wall material on it so we can see how this is looking. Um, I want the texture to be going in the opposite direction of what it currently is. So I'm just going to grab these little side pieces here, which represent this, this half or not half this face and these, these thin faces. And I'm just going to move them over 
because uh, I'm mostly concerned with the top and bottom faces here. So all I have to do here is rotate these by 90 degrees and they will be going the other direction. I'm just going to move these up so that they're within my 0 to 1 UV space here. And if you want to get really exact, you can turn on snapping for the UVs as well. And that should snap everything to uh, the bounds of your of your uh, image here. OK, so um, let's look about look at how to line up these sides now. So I'm going to grab uh, one of these faces. OK, so it looks like this top face is this face right here. And if we turn on sync selection, if we grab this edge, it's this edge right here. So if I wanted this to wrap seamlessly around, I would have to line this edge from this face up with this edge from this face on the UV uh, texture space. So it looks like it's this edge right here. So I can just grab this whole island here and move it over and um, if you think about it, this makes sense because this is where this one ends. So the next one should begin basically on the same pixel. And the closer you can get these UV islands, the more uh, seamlessly they will match. Now, you may be kind of wondering, well, aren't we supposed to have padding between our UV islands? Um, that is true for unique pieces. If you're using a tiling texture, the closer you can get this, the better it's going to tile. Um, we can also turn on snapping and change the snapping to vertex. Uh, so basically what this will do is if I grab this piece and move it around, it will snap the points to the nearest vertex that it can find. But you can see here in the 3D viewport that this looks pretty good. It's pretty much wrapping seamlessly around. OK. And in fact, if I wanted it to wrap fully seamlessly, I would need to put this side over here. But you can see where I would quickly run into a problem is that I have to break it up somewhere. Um, but there are other techniques you can use to fix this. You can uh, butterfly them. Um, so basically uh, flipping, mirroring this island over and then stacking it directly on top of this one will give it the exact same texture, but in reverse, which is really good for uh, tiling. But um, I'm not particularly concerned with the bottom. I don't think that it's going to be an issue. Um, but if I wanted to make this side wrap, I could definitely do that. It's this end here to this end here. So um, I'm going to grab this face and I'm going to move it over. And you can see with the vertex snapping on it snaps directly to that edge there. Um, and I just want to move this over because these are currently overlapping each other. And it does look fine uh, in the viewport, but I know that I can do better. So I'm just going to move it over so that they're snapped perfectly together. All right. Um, we can do the same thing with these ends here. Let's rotate them by 90 degrees. If we change the uh, rotation point, it's rotating around this uh, 2D cursor. So it, when I rotate it at 90, it put them all the way down here, which I don't want. So I just changed the pivot on these. So basically what I can do, let's find that edge. It's, uh, this one here to this one here. So. Let's move it right. Come on. Okay, snapping isn't playing nice with me right now, but we can just manually align it, and that is good enough for the eye. And same thing here. Let's look at this edge. It's this bottom edge here. And this top edge here. So what I can do, if there's enough room on the sheet, I can move this whole thing up. And let's put this one down here. It should be OK. Ooh, looks like we're just over. And just off by a little bit. Let's see if we can move this up at all. 
yeah, we have a we have a pixel or two of a room. Let's move that up. Okay, so that is how I would unwrap for this texture for this piece. Uh, let's check our pivot points. So this one is in the corner, the bottom. Yeah, the bottom one of the bottom corners here. So, and it's going this way in the x direction, actually, I believe, right? Yes. So this is going to be the x direction. So we need to rotate this by 90 degrees because our x direction is going this way. So let's rotate this uh, around the z axis by 90 degrees. And uh, we need to set our pivot to one of these corners. Let's set it to this bottom corner right here. So I'm going to hit tab to come into edit mode. I'm going, going to uh, go into vertex select. I'm going to select the vertex I want to be my pivot. And then I'm going to move my 3D cursor to that point by pressing shift and S and picking cursor to selected. I'm going to tab out of um, out of edit mode into object mode and I'm going to right click on the object and set origin to 3D cursor. Okay, so um, let's make sure we have our rotation applied as well. And we can clear our location by hitting Alt and G on the keyboard together. So that will snap the pivot to the world center. Okay, we can also reset our 3D cursor by pressing Shift and C. Okay, so let's export this out. Well, export as an FBX, of course. Um, I'm already in my tile set because Blender remembers the last place I exported from this file. So we're going to call this static mesh underscore floor one by four meters. And I'm going to make sure that it's limited to only my selected objects and export. Okay. Um, let's bring this into our game here. We're going to import. And I have this under tile sets, uh, one by four. Okay, uh, it's not a skeletal mesh. And we already have our material set up for it, so we can just hit import all. That's fine, don't worry about that. Um, so let's just apply our material here, let's save, and we can close out these old tabs from our last unit, and let's replace this the one to make sure it fits before I replace everything. Floor. Perfect. Now there is a little bit of sort of an issue with the tiling right here. How you want to fix that, if you want to fix that, is up to you. It's not super noticeable. Um, and generally, with a game art, especially for something this simplistic, I, I tend to be a little bit forgiving with things like this, personally. Um, a player that doesn't know may not even notice it. But you can always cover it up with a column. You can make a unique column sort of corner cap piece for these caps. It's actually not a bad idea. I might do that in a future video. Um, let's replace these guys. And like if you wanted this to be a different texture, like if you wanted this to be like a, a like a rickety wooden bridge, you could definitely do that as well. Now there is sort of an issue here with the tiling um, along the stretch. So um, let let's look at how we could go about fixing something like this. We may have to make some edits to our mesh itself. But I'm going to finish replacing these before I go back and do that. Okay, so um, let's look at how to fix this gap right here. Um, the most obvious way to me would be to scale the UVs so that this gap occurs at one of the grout lines. Um, so let's see if that will fix it for us. So um, we're really just concerned with this face and this face. And yeah, in fact, they're they're cutting sort of at a halfway point between the grout. So let's try to move this whole thing so that it just stacks a little bit better. So let's move this up. Now, I know I have this outside of the zero to one UV space, but if you recall from our uh, main part of a course, we um, 
the, this thing will essentially tile infinitely, so it is okay to have some of these outside of the zero to one space if you are using a tiling texture. Um, so let's look at this. We may want to stretch this a little bit too. So that it covers the entirety of this uh, this Y space here. So because our, our issues are coming from this not matching up with this end, basically. So actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it down in the Y direction. Now keep in mind that when you're using the working in the UV space, you don't have um, X, Y, and Z. You only have X and Y. Um, so to move something up, instead of pressing the Z on the keyboard, you would press Y because you don't have a Z dimension. Okay, let's see if we can't change our pivot to 2D and scale this up in the Y. Let's see if that tiles a little bit better. And we can check this faster within Blender itself if we just stick an array modifier on it. So um, this will show you any way that it needs to tile or any issues that you have with the tiling here. So this looks much better. I think the seam, the seam is right here, but since it's in that grout line, um, you can't tell quite as much. So let's re-export this and bring it back into uh, Unreal. Export. And let's come into the static mesh itself and hit re-import. See a little adjustment here, but now tiles much more cleanly. Very cool. Okay. So I'm just taking a minute to think about what I want to do next. I think I am going to replace all of these prototype columns with our static mesh column because um, the static mesh itself is is good for this piece. I, I It's just a texture I'm not sure if I want and I can always put a different texture on it later. As long as I'm using the same piece, it shouldn't matter. As long as my textures are built properly. Um, let's see if we can do this faster. I'm gonna just call them column. Yeah. So I'm just filtering out everything that is a column. And I'm just gonna select them all and then I'm gonna replace them with the static mesh column. And this might take a little bit longer because I'm doing so many at once. So uh, just kind of be patient. Unreal's a little bit frozen right now, but it's, it's just thinking. There we go. So we still have some issues obviously with the texture, but it's a decent placeholder and it's, it's better than having the bright purple, in my opinion. There's some Z fighting here, but we can just sink these down into the floor to avoid that. And it also sort of helps break up this texture a little bit. Um, another way to break up textures, tiling textures, is just sort of like rotate th certain things by 90 degrees. Um, and you can also flip them around 180 degrees if you really want to break it up. So basically they're upside down now, but um, it, it's just a little bit of variation between the placement of the bricks essentially between this and this. And I will probably go in and replace this with a different texture at a later date, but this is fine for now. Um, that's the one thing to keep in mind about game design is that it is always, always, always iterative. So the first art asset you put in your game is typically not gonna be the final result. So it looks pretty good. We have no more big obnoxious prototype grids uh, for our architecture pieces, although I think we do have them in here and on the stairs still.
So the stairs are a little bit more complex than our simple wall or floor pieces. And to make sure that I get the dimensions of them right, instead of trying to uh, rebuild them in Blender from scratch, from a cube essentially, because um, I think it would, it would be too complicated. So what I can do is export this sort of primitive to an FBX file and then bring that into Blender. So um, what I can do here is I've gone into my mesh uh, generated folder. I can select my stairs and right click on them. And under asset actions, you have this export option here. So it's gonna ask you for a location to export it. Um, let's just put it under our tile set. Stairs for a meter, that's my name. And then we also get this export options, um, the file type. Um, we don't need vertex color. We don't need a level of detail. And we don't, we especially don't want collision because collision is going to give us sort of this uh, mesh on top of this mesh, which will probably some be something more like a ramp. And uh, we just want the stairs. And we don't have any morph targets, so we don't have to uncheck those, but we can do it. Okay, hit export. And let's see if that came out correctly. I'm just going to move all of these over here so that they're more uh, consolidated. And I like to keep the origin of my world free because that's typically where things come in as long as your 3D cursor is there. OK, let's file import FBX. Let's pick our stairs. And there we go. There's our stairs. I'm not going to. Um, I mean, I can I can change the rotation just if it's easier to work with, but I'm going I want the rotation to stay the same. The nice thing about exporting uh, from your mesh primitives is that your rotation, your pivot and everything is always going to be the, uh, the correct one. So um, the first thing that I notice about these stairs is that I don't. If I want to UV unwrap these, I don't really need this face or this face because I don't think there's any case in the game where we see them. So I could go so far as to delete them. Uh, but you see here, um, selection becomes a little bit harder when you bring things in from Unreal uh, because by default, when you bring a mesh into Unreal, it's going to triangulate the entire mesh. That's just what game engines do. So um, you see we have a lot of triangles going on here, but we can easily uh, convert this if we just hit space to pull up our search bar and let's type in tries to and we have tries to quads so um, it's an algorithm that will look at all your faces and if it can make an easy quad out of them it will and you can see it's basically just deleted all mine diagonal lines in here so they just have um, a nice pretty quad mesh here and um, what's great about this is I can reduce the geometry on this a lot and uh, save on some performance. So performance in part uh, is controlled by how many faces your object has. The more faces it has, the longer it takes the computer to render and the harder it is on your machine. So all of these faces essentially, I mean, they're there because that is how Unreal uh, sort of did this automatic construction and it's very clean, but they're very unnecessary. So like all of these basically can be dissolved into a single face. Um, and this is much easier on the machine to render than all those little individual faces. So, I mean, we don't really need them at all. We can, we could in fact, delete them and it would function just as well if not better for performance and here as well because we never see the back or the bottom of these stairs and um, I'm just going to re-export this before we start the textures to show you what I mean and also to make sure that I don't make any mistakes early on so if I hit export FBX I'm just going to overwrite this stairs uh, export here and we have selected objects Okay, so we still won't have our texture, but um, I'm just gonna make sure that deleting these faces didn't mess it up in our game at all. It shouldn't have though. So um, instead of re-import, I can't really re-import because this was created from Unreal. So I'm just going to import into my mesh folder here. Uh, upstairs, there we go. Should be fine. It's moving, that's fine. Let's replace it with our new mesh. Okay, so basically all it did was, I mean, it, it replaced the entire thing, but 
visually nothing really happened. We have the back here that is not being rendered, but uh, we saved a little bit in performance. And the most important thing I think that the most important reason I should say for deleting back faces is that it saves on UV space. So I was probably going to use a tiling texture for this, but if this were a unique piece, um, basically you don't want to take up a bunch of your UV space with a face that you're never going to see. Um, there's just no reason for it. So let's put on our material and get to unwrapping this. Okay, so all of these stairs currently share the same UV space. You can see that they're all, this is the side, but this is, they're all stacked on top of each other right now, um, which is a little weird because they all look exactly the same. So we just want to vary the steps. So um, the first thing that I would do um, in order to make my selections easier, I'm going to come into this UV side and I'm going to come into the UV menu and I'm just going to say seams from islands. So basically, if you bring in an FBX, the seam information, like the UVs will be correct, but the seams won't be there. So um, just so I don't destroy this really clean setup I have, I'm going to make seams from islands. So it'll look at the islands, look at where the edges are and mark those edges as seams. That's all it does. So what I can do now is um, I'm going to start just by moving this off to the side because I'm going to do this next, but I'm just going to move it off to the side for now. And I'm just going to look at these steps. So I'm going to select this top one. I'm going to hold control and select this bottom one. Oops. Nope. I want it to come down. Okay. I kind of have to do it incrementally because I want to come down through these steps and select all of these. So they're all layered on top of each other right now, sharing the exact same UV space. And um, that's not really what I want. So all I'm going to do, let's keep a preview of it right here so we can make sure that we're looking OK. But um, I'm just going to move the islands around, basically. So I can create like this island and this island if I wanted them to stack properly. Um, this is gonna, probably going to take a while, but I think it'll be it'll be worth it. Okay, let's turn on vertex snapping and see if I can. The problem with vertex snapping sometimes, unfortunately, is um, it doesn't want to move once it's on a vertex. So I'm, I'm trying to get it to wrap nicely um, between these stairs. So I need to know where this edge is in my UV layout. Okay, so that's the edge. It's this, this edge right here. Yeah. A little bit of this is going to just be eyeballing it, unfortunately. That's just the way it goes. There we go. Okay, so now I have basically the grout coming around uh, nice and neat here. So I can just move this one maybe up here to wherever it looks decent. That looks pretty good. Okay. And basically, I'm just going to do this for all of them. And I'm going to try to place them on different blocks so that from here to from this step to this step, it's not um, not exactly the same texture space, right? So we don't have just one single line of grout running down. That would be not very realistic. So already these two top steps look a lot better than these.
And um, when you're using tiling textures, it is actually okay to overlap your, your UVs if you need to. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, Unreal will bring in your, any mesh you bring in, Unreal will generate a light map for it, which is a basically a secondary set of UVs. And uh, the purpose of light maps is for shading information. So um, because it generates those, it doesn't matter if you have overlapping UVs for tiling textures, at least. I just think it looks a little bit nicer when they're not placed exactly so that there's like a horizontal grout running here. So I'm just trying to scoot them onto regions of this mesh where that isn't occurring. Like so. Let's grab this face and bring it down. Okay, so you get the idea. It's going to go all the way down that way. Oops. Yeah, make sure you're hovering in the uh, 2D section, otherwise you'll move your mesh around in sort of unintended ways. And this one can share with the top one. Okay. Just sort of trying to make them random. So a lot of these steps are going to share texture space, but as long as they're broken up and right not, ne not right next to each other in the 3D, um, it won't be noticeable. And I'm also trying to not repeat the order of the texture space. So like this first one I put right here. And then the, let's say if this next one was like one down from it on the texture, I don't want to repeat that, right? So I don't want them to follow the same order. I want them to be as, as random as possible, if that makes sense. Pretty good. That one right there. Let's see, that one doesn't have another one. One last one to do, something like that. And let's put this one right in the middle. Okay, so these are my stairs. Um, obviously there's still some texture wrapping issues right here, but again, sort of as a alpha art asset, I think this is pretty good. So let's save this out. Um, we have a, our scale here is a little funky, so let's apply it. Um, that was sort of a result of importing it from Unreal. It got a little weird, but let's export this out to stairs. And we're going to re-import it here. Uh, yes, so if you get this, it's um, basically it's just detecting that we changed the material. So the material slot 
for the this asset no longer matches and it's just asking do we want to set it to the new one yes we do okay there we go and there's our stairs with our proper uvs need to work on the uh lighting in this scene as well we can't see really a lot of what's going on Gonna throw a point light in here. And I've also noticed um, some artifacts with these rect lights. These rect lights were super useful in Unreal Engine 4, but uh, since coming over to 5, I've noticed that they cause these really harsh and like faceted shadows and um, I'm not getting that a lot with using point lights. So this is probably something that Epic is currently working on. Um, you can see if I replace this with a point light, the shadows are much softer. So I imagine that Epic is aware of this and currently working on a fix for the rect lights. Um, point lights are more commonly used, I think, but uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean that the rect lights aren't don't have their own use case. Okay. All right, this is looking pretty good. Let's replace the stairs up here with our new asset. Okay, beautiful. And um, we just have a few more to go. We have these blocks, um, which can have the same texture on it. I know that like, everything has this texture right now, so it's like very, very boring. But, um, you know, typically when you're creating levels, like, if you, I mean, for a production, you'd probably have a few more tile tiling textures than this. But um, again, this was created just for the purposes of demonstration here and um, we can always come in and replace them if we make a new tiling texture in the future but I my goal right now is just to get away from these prototype assets uh, these prototype uh, textures I should say and uh, start getting sort of an alpha art section going this is very much pre-alpha but you get the idea dark in here. Let's see if we can do something about the lighting. There we go. So this is what I mean about like the columns. Like we put these in the corners to like break stuff up, but when it has the same texture on it, it's not really breaking much up. Um, so we're probably going to come in and replace these at some point. Maybe not on this video, but if I were trying to finish this level, I would, I would come in and replace them. Okay. So um, let's let's unwrap these for this tiling texture as well, and then we'll wrap up this video. But okay, let's look at the dimensions of this. This is looks one, two, three, four, four, four by three by three. Okay, that's easy enough to recreate in Blender. It's just a block. Let's move our stairs off over here, and let's add a new mesh, a cube. It's gonna be uh, three by three by four and let's just apply the scale straight away um, let's check our pivot it's in this top corner here so uh, let's set our pivot to that as well I'm just gonna pick a top corner uh, because this is really symmetrical it really doesn't matter which one I pick set origin to 3d cursor all right can even put that at the world origin if we felt the need to Let's put our wall material. I'm going to rename this because I'm tired of looking at this placeholder name. OK, so um, obviously this is not going to work for our unwrapping, but let's mark everything as a seam again because we have a very simplistic block. We want every edge to be a seam. And let's hit U and unwrap. OK, slightly better. Um, let's just fix some of these issues. I think the scale might be a little bit off here, so I might want to up res these ends here. And in fact, I don't think I need this bottom face at all because everywhere 
in our game. Like these go all the way, or they should go all the way to the floor, I guess. Get to, get this one down. So if these go all the way to the floor and they're always stacked on top of each other, we're never gonna see that bottom face and it is just wasting space in our UV maps. So let's delete it. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's just delete this bottom face because we don't need it. If you wanna keep the faces, but you still don't wanna waste the UV space, stacking them is also a value, is like a totally valid option. Like you can just have them be the same. But um, I don't. I don't even want it. Let's get rid of it. Okay. Let's unwrap these again. Um, I'm actually just going to import this right now and see how this scale looks before I start messing with it too much. So let's export FBX. Let's call this. What was it called? It was called uh, Platform Three Meters. Export and let's bring it into Unreal here in our mesh folder platform. The settings should be good from last time. Let's put our wall material in it. Okay. I mean, it looks good. I mean, it looks how it's supposed to look, but um, let's check our texture scale here. I'm just gonna replace them all. I'm not sure why this does this. I think this is a, an Unreal Engine 5 bug. Typically, if you have this highlighted already, it should just pop up in your replace. Like, that's the first thing, but I found since upgrading to Unreal 5, you have to kind of click away and back, and then it will be there. Oh, we've got the pivot off. Um, yeah, that's right. So it does matter which which one you pick as the pivot because uh, it's not in the center. So I'm not sure which one it is. So I'm just gonna do a little trial and error here. Let's try this one. And replace. Oh. Let's try this one. Really? It's always the last one you try. Um, it also might just be because I did not place it in the center. Um, I kind of forget. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes if you don't, like even though your pivot is set correctly, if you don't have the pivot centered in the world uh, with certain types of exports, it, it does cause an issue in the editor. It's basically saving the location, so apologize for this taking longer than something this easy reasonably should, but... Okay, I'm getting frustrated, so I'm just gonna move these over manually, because I'm starting not to care. Okay. Alright, that's fine. Okay, so um, this texture scale is a bit off. Um, you can see right here um, on the actual floor pieces, it's much smaller than it is on the uh, platform pieces. So let's fix that. So I'm just going to grab this face. Well, all of them, I guess. I want them to be consistent. Let's just scale this up. Now, normally you wouldn't be able to go outside of the bounds of your texture resolution, but of course this is a tiling texture, so it does not matter. Okay, let's try that.
Oh my gosh. You must be joking. Okay, so um, it could probably stand to be even a little bit smaller. If you look right here. It's not too off, but um, if we scale these up even more, it will cause the res the texture to tile more and be be the pattern to be smaller. Okay. Sorry, this pivot thing is just really bothering me. Okay, it's that one. Yeah, okay. I'm not really sure why it's doing that, to be honest with you. Okay, there we go. That's much closer. So it's probably not exact, but that is close enough for our purposes anyway. Okay. Um, so the last piece we here would be the gate, but um, that's going to require a completely new texture because we don't have any sort of like metal textures already set up and ready to go. So I'm going to leave that there for now and um, we can come back and address that in a future video. All right, so in our last video, we started cleaning up the level and uh, getting rid of some of our placeholder assets. Uh, so in this one, I'm just going to continue that process. And for this video, I'd like to focus on this piece here, which is of course our health pickup. Uh, right now it is just a plain yellow sphere, but uh, for this video, I am going to go into Blender and model a new asset for it to replace the sphere. And uh, then we're gonna bring it into Unreal. So uh, let's get started with that. So I am just going to open up Blender here somewhere. And um, we're just gonna start with a new file entirely. Um, so I'm just going to click off of the splash screen to get my default file and I am just going to delete everything. Um, so for this asset, I am going to be replacing it with the model of a banana because of course our character is a little monkey. So he needs to eat bananas to heal up. So let's start, I um, downloaded just a really basic reference image for this. If I can navigate to it. Um, I just Googled, you know, banana, and I found one that was roughly, uh, you know, viewed from the side. So um, let's just get started. Um, I just brought in my image here. I'm just gonna drop the opacity. And I'm just gonna bring this up so it's sort of centered with this x-axis line. And I suppose the best way to go about this would be to start with a cylinder because it's a roughly cylindrical shape. So I'm just going to add a new cylinder to the scene. Um, I actually don't want to fill the caps just yet. Um, so I'm just going to put nothing and I'll, I'll address that later. So I'm just going to worry about the main shape of it. So I'm just going to scale it down, rotate it by 90 degrees. So it's running this way. And um, this mesh is not really symmetrical, so I think we're just gonna have to model it sort of traditionally. Um, not that mirrors are not traditional, but we're just gonna have to model the whole thing by, by hand, more or less. Uh, but it should go really quickly. Because it's a very simple shape. So I'm just hitting E to extrude out here. And actually, I should probably turn on my uh, key capture. Hold on one moment. Okay, I got my keystrokes on here. Um, again, unfortunately, the one I use doesn't capture any mouse clicks, but uh, it's really the hotkeys that are, that are most important in Blender. So I'm just gonna extrude this out to get a rough shape, I guess to about here. And again, because we are going for a uh, more cartoon stylized look, um, 
we can take some liberties with this reference and simplify it a lot. That looks pretty good. I might just shift some of these around so that they're a little bit more evenly distributed. Uh, and then we should probably bring this out once more for the top and pinch it sort of in. That's probably pretty good. Yeah, I would say that looks like a banana. Um, let's fill these end caps in now that I have taken care of the shape. Let's shade this smooth and let's put a subdivision surface modifier on it to smooth out those uh, really faceted parts. And I'm going to add an edge loop here to make this a little bit more squared off. And probably here. Oops, not there. Here. Awesome. Okay. Now, this is quite dense for the size and um, the importance of this mesh. So I am going to uh, leave all my subdivisions that are going this way, but I want to reduce some of my geometry going around because I just don't think it's necessary, especially with the subdivision surface modifier. So I'm just going to uh, hide that modifier in the viewport for just a moment while I come in and select my edge loops here. This is uh, Shift and Alt will help let you select this way. You know, we didn't cover a lot of um, modeling of this nature in the main course. We mostly worked on sculpting objects. Um, so I do want to you know, take a little bit of time to show you some more traditional modeling techniques. Um, I think I need another support loop right here. Look at this picture again. It's like you think you know what a banana looks like and, until you go to make one, and then you have no idea. I think this can be, oops, not that, straightened out a little bit, like that. And this can probably be brought down. Um, the, these changes I'm making not less based off of the reference image and more just based off of like my idea of what a cartoon sort of banana should look like if that makes sense. Okay, so I mean, that is pretty much all we need to do for the modeling part of this. I mean, if we really wanted to do some like photorealism, we would then take this into sculpting and, you know, sculpt in all sorts of little surface details and spots and things. But, um, you know, we're going for, for something a little bit more, uh, a little more stylized. So I think we're good. We can probably just uh, UV unwrap this and bake out some some textures. Well, not bake out. We don't really have anything to bake, but we we can move forward. Sorry, I say that, and I'm then obsessively tweaking this model. A uh, big part of 3D art is knowing when to stop, but that's not that's sometimes easier said than done. Um, I'm just trying to push these two edge loops together to get this sort of line, this sort of um, corner that you get sort of on these on these guys. I don't want it to be like extreme, like hard, flat surfaces, but I just I do want to uh, maybe make a little bit of that happen. So um, all I'm doing here is double tapping G and sliding the entire edge loop over to push them together, which gives a little bit of a pinch in the model. Okay, that looks pretty good. Yeah, that's a banana. Okay, so let's go ahead and delete that and we can UV unwrap this. Um, so I'm gonna leave this as a modifier right now. We'll apply it before we bring it in. But um, 
for the purposes of the UVs, it's easier if you have less edges to work with. So um, let's come in here. Um, I'm gonna make a new, new UV grid just to visualize my, um, sort of my islands and how they're stretching. Uh, and 1024 is totally fine. You don't need to make these like 4K textures because they're not, uh, they're just sort of a tool that we use. They're not final in any way. I'm just noticing that these aren't that this these two edges and these two edges aren't really very even with each other. If I wanted them perfect, I would use a, a mirror modifier and I don't want that, but um, I do want them somewhat even, just for clarity. Let's mark our seam. Let's mark this one along the back and one around here. And now um, traditional game development wisdom tells you that you should uh, either make this end gone, which is an end gone is any face that has more than four sides. You should make this into something that is either quadrilateral or triangulated. Um, however, I will say that in Unreal, this sort of step is sort of unnecessary as when you bring a mesh into Unreal, it will triangulate all your faces anyway. So um, you can select this and hit Control and T to triangulate it, but Unreal is going to do this for us. So I typically only bother with that if I, when I bring it into Unreal, I'm getting like shading errors and, and weird shadows and things. Um, it is typically caused by issues such as this, having end guns in your mesh. So um, yes. To be technically correct and perfect, you should do that, but um, I'm not gonna bother with it unless I have issues. I'm just gonna unwrap. Oh, and of course we forgot to apply our image texture to our model. Okay, here we go. There's a little bit of stretching going on, especially down here. Um, but it's not too bad. We could uh, further break this up to eliminate the stretching um, if we so chose, but that does come with more seams, means there's more areas where there's potentially breaks in your texture. Um, so it's really up to you if you want to do that. I think that looks a little bit better, a little bit less stretching going on. Okay, so we're gonna leave these as our UVs here. Um, let's see, I don't, believe we can lay these out any more efficiently because this island is so large. Um, I am going to pull these away from the edge, but uh, we're going to leave it like that and maybe scale this. Actually, instead of scaling this down, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this diagonally because you get more uh, area on a 2D plane diagonally than you do straight across. So, um, Actually, maybe we can scale this up a little. I'm just going to change my pivot to individual origin so that they remain in place, and I'm just going to scale them. And remember that I have them all selected so that I maintain like a consistent texel density across the uh, the entirety of the model here. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. Oops, and that looks good. Okay. So um, I have no normal maps or anything to bake for this, so I can just jump straight into the texture painting portion. Um, so let's get rid of our UV grid and let's make a new base color for this by jumping into texture paint mode. Now, if you ever see this in Blender, this bright pink color, that just means that the texture is missing. So um, it's just sort of an error coloring that Blender uses. So um, you'll see here that I have no textures. We've not seen this before because we've always baked maps from a high poly, but this is such a simplistic object that we don't really need to do that. So um, all we have to do is just add a new base color. Let's give this a 2K texture. Um, I'm not going to bother making this 4K because this is going to be such a small 
object in our game level that it would be kind of a waste to use such a large texture on such a small object that we're never really gonna see that close up. So 2K is like totally fine. Could probably even get away with 1024. Okay, so a uh, pink error is gone. I am going to switch this over to my other screen so I can use my pen to paint on this. So just give me a moment to do that. Okay, and we are back. So um, let's just start texturing this. I'm going to sample colors from my reference um, just because I already have it in here. There's nothing that says you need to sample your colors. I just like to do it to be really exact, but um, you can just pick like sort of a gold yellow and I'm just gonna come in and start painting. Pretty much over the whole thing. I could have done this with a fill uh, when I went to create my texture, but I don't know. I didn't, so we'll just have to move on. Um, and I really, I, I kind of like doing this with the base color because, and not doing it via fill, because you get sort of a natural variation in the intensity of the color when you paint it by hand, uh, as opposed to filling it programmatically. It, um, there's just some areas that are, are more opaque than others and stuff. So you get a very slight natural color variation here, which uh, just kind of speeds things up because we add, we typically add color variation in any way. So, um, you know, this is a, a quick way to do that is just by hand painting. Let's change to our uh, material view because we are currently in our solid shaded mode. So everything is sort of overlaid on the gray and I'm not really getting uh, an accurate picture of what my colors look like. So I'm gonna switch to my, uh, my material preview. Of course, I haven't hooked up my base color texture yet. So let's jump over to the shading and see what's up here. It's just a little bit confused. So let's just plug our color from our base color in and we can jump back to our texture paint. And there we go. We have much more accurate representation of our colors now. Okay. Um, so the stem is sort of green. So let's put that in. and make sure we're blending out any harsh lines that we get as a result of our, uh, in our view plane. Cool. And then I think a little bit of green sort of at the bottom here would be also welcome. Forgot to save my colors. That's all right. We can sample it again. It probably won't be the exact same shade of yellow, but it will be close enough. Okay, so we just need like a little dark brown spot, really. And then we can call this done. blend this green into this yellow a bit more. So I'm gonna come in with my yellow color and drop my strength down by like half-ish and just come in and blend that because the line is looking a bit harsh. And then I wanna do that same brown up, maybe a slightly lighter brown up at the top. So, um, I mean, this is the color from the sample, but I think it's actually going to look 
better if it's closer to this color that we used for the bottom. So let's just sample something and of course I forgot to save it again. Yeah, I think that looks better. It's more recognizable as a banana if we make the top brown. Jumping back to the green just to blend in some of these weird areas. And maybe it went a little overkill on the brown here, but that looks pretty good. Again, you can spend as much or as little time on your assets as you wish. Um, you know, it just depends on sort of the quality you're aiming for and your time frame for your project, because obviously if you spend, you know, a week and a half making a single banana, well, you're never really gonna get much done. So, um, a lot of times with game art in particular, it's just a, a sort of a balancing act between quality and, uh, um, you know, getting things done and making sure they work and performance and all that good stuff. I just wanna fade this in a little bit. Maybe with some yellow. Ooh. Okay. Okay, so that is is good. Um, at least for the you know the stage of development that we are at, we can always come in and replace assets with or final versions later, but a lot of times it's very helpful to have sort of a pre-alpha uh, that is a step closer to finish than your prototype than just having the, the sphere, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your finished asset. Um, I'm noticing some seams right along here when I zoom out, so I'm actually gonna jump back and just fix those. So um, if you recall, two of these seams are happening because uh, basically this background gray color that we have on our texture asset is bleeding over onto our UV island. So all we have to do to fix that is to uh, come in with our brown here. And this brown is a little bit off of our base. Come in with this brown here and um, kind of extend that color over the edges of our UV island into our negative UV space here, and uh, that will fix any seam issues we have. And in fact, we can do that with all of our colors and all of our seams. Since we have so much room to spare on our UV map here, um, there's really no reason why we shouldn't come in and uh, give it some padding so that it doesn't, uh, so you can't see any seams when we're zoomed out. So we can see like there's one big seam right there. So I'm just gonna color this whole island in. The browns are slightly different from each other because I forgot to save my first sample. So I'm just gonna pick one and, and roll with it. And of course we need to blend it in um, up here because they're slightly different. And we can also jump freely back between the 2D and 3D uh, workspaces here. And just paint as needed. Okay, um, 
So let's grab our green. Um, this should be okay, but I'm just gonna come around the edges really briefly here, just to avoid any seams. And the green also on this end. And over here. This is a little bit trickier because I don't want to uh, mess up any of the textures I've already painted. So you have to be a little bit careful around these edges where you have color change, but uh, you should be okay. We'll come around with the yellow. I'm not being super precise because I'm doing this with my mouse. Because uh, I want the full opacity here. And I guess I could just turn off the pressure. That'd probably be better. And I can get a better line going here. So now I'm looking at, I uh, see one little error there. Just can't let it go. So let's come in with the yellow and just blend that out a little bit. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I think that looks all right. I mean, I could spend forever sort of tweaking the texture paint on this, and uh, if it were up to me, I probably would, but um, in the interest of time, we're gonna call this complete. And, you know, it, it is totally sufficient. This looks like a banana. I don't think there'd be any confusion as to what this object is. So um, let's call this complete, at least for an alpha stage, and let's get it into Unreal. Um, so it's already at the center of the world. Um, I'm gonna just rotate it by 90 degrees in the, oops, in the uh, Y direction. Um, maybe not 90, maybe like, it's got, I want it to sit like this, basically, and hover like this in the world. So I'm going to rotate it to where I want it, and I'm going to apply my transformations, and I'm just going to export it. Mm. Let's call this banana. And export. Okay, um, let's jump back into Unreal now. Okay, so we're back in Unreal and let's um, not do that. Let's import our mesh. Oh, that's gonna be annoying, hang on. Import. Banana. Oh, of course, and I forgot to save my textures. So um, before I even do that, let me bring up my my texture paint here. So we need to save this, of course, otherwise it's no good to us. Luckily, I did not close up Blender or anything. So um, let's call this D. Base color and save. 
Okay. Um, let's import our mesh here. Don't worry about that. And a new textures. Let's bring in our saved out base color. So um, when we looked at the materials before, for all of our material setups, we have multiple maps. And for this one, we only have a base color. So uh, we're not gonna be reusing any of e either of the character or the um, or the, the wall, which we made the Olmec based off of. So we're just gonna make a new material here. Let's just call this M base color. Um, actually, since we don't have another asset that's using it right now, I don't really need to extend its functionality. So it can just be the material for the banana. Okay, let's bring in our texture and really easy. It only has one. No roughness information or anything. No normal maps. Okay. Oh, it looks great. Okay, so the last step is to put it into the blueprint itself and make sure that everything still works the way we expect it to. So I'm just going to come into the viewport, into the static mesh here, and change it to our banana. It's so small. I um, didn't check the scale stupidly before I exported it, so, oh, no, the, the scale, it was scaled down in the blueprint, that's what happened. Um, and then it didn't change the uh, material because I had it set to something other than the default, so I'm just going to hit reset to default and it will reset it to the default for whatever the static mesh is. Um, so I'm just going to scale this because I'm not... Uh, particularly concerned about it. Actually, I'm just going to pop this out and see how big it is in the level. Okay, so it's quite it's quite large in the level, so actually I should probably scale it down, if anything. But um, what's happening right now is because I have this collision sphere parented to the mesh aspect, when I scale the mesh itself, it's scaling the sphere as well. So I just need to unparent that. So I'm going to drag this up and it will unparent those things. So I can now have this large enough to encompass this. And in fact, it should be the other way around. Um, so now I can scale the mesh within the sphere here. And I can also, within the level, look at how large it is and uh, scale it appropriately based off of that. I mean, I want it large enough to see. So, and it is sort of a a cartoon-ish look, which means that you typically want to make things larger than they actually are. Okay, that looks pretty good. Um, okay, last thing I'm going to do for this video is I'm just going to hit play from here and just see if this is like, yeah, that's like comically large. So, um, the scale is one in the level, so I just need to scale it down in the, uh, in the blueprint itself, the entire thing. Let's just reset the scale to one. Okay, that's large, but it's large enough for us to see, but um, not like ridiculous giant banana. Ooh, tiling is off. Does this need to be flipped around? Um, I just noticed that my tiling on my mesh here was a little bit off, so I'm just trying to line these up so there's not this egregious seam line here. What is happening? Uh, I'm just going to delete that and I'm going to reduplicate it straight out along the x-axis so I know it's going to tile perfectly. There we go. Okay, so um, we can now like rotate this any way we want. And if we play from here, yeah, that seems about right. I mean, it's a little large, you could scale it down, but I want it to be large enough for the player to see and notice and want to go investigate it. And especially at this scale, at this view distance, there is no doubt in my mind what that object is. 
So, um, yeah. I, that is gonna conclude the uh, video on how to create a mesh asset for our health pickup. Um, so I will see you guys in the next video. All right, so the next asset I want to look at creating a replacement mesh for are these fire assets. Uh, currently, we just have these little tiny like cubes in the wall and the fire just sort of magically spurts out of them. So um, let's look at how to what we can do to replace this asset. Now, um, initially, I was going to do something pretty simple and straightforward, but um, I actually went back to my reference board and um, this was one of the images I had saved and I just think this is, this is so cool. So we're gonna do something, um, probably a simplified version of this, just in the interest of time, I'm, I'm sort of running out of time here um, to finish up all these assets in detail. So we're gonna do something along these lines and have the fire coming out of the mouth and I just think that's gonna be really cool. So um, let's get started, let's jump into Blender. Um, this is just a default Blender scene. Um, I'm going to delete these things and I'm going to bring in my reference image. Okay. So um, again, I'm going to keep this as a loose reference. I'm not trying to recreate it one to one or anything like that. Uh, we just want something that's vaguely reminiscent of this. And of course, um, since this is a sort of cuboid shape, let's start with a cube. So we want this to be visible in perspective. So I'm gonna enable that and I'm gonna move it back a little bit. And we can always have it up in a 2D image editing view here, which might be more useful to us actually, since we're not doing one to one. Um, but we can use it as sort of a general shape guide. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop the opacity because I can't see what I'm doing and I'm going to try to position this roughly in the center. It's not going to be perfect because most photo sourced textures or, you know, even concept arts, they're not perfectly symmetrical most of the time. Um, and most of the things you concepts and things you're going to be working off of will not be symmetrical, but um, unless you're given like a a proper modeling sheet, which doesn't happen all that often. Unless you're working in like a very professional environment. Okay. So let's just scale this in and I'm going to bring the bottom up a little bit and bring the top down a little bit. And just trying to think if I want to use a subdivision surface. I don't think I do because I want the faces, the front and the back face to remain pretty flat. Uh, but I am going to scale it down in the Y so it's a little bit thinner. It won't be sticking out of the wall as much. So this back face right here is going to be against our wall. Um, so instead of using a subdivision surface to round this out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all these corner edges like so. And I'm going to hit Control and B to bevel them. Uh, I just realized I do not have my screen capture on. Key capture, whatever you call it. Um, so let's control Z to undo that. Um, let's control B to get it roughly to the position that you want. And then uh, from this bevel context menu, if you want this to be more rounded and less like a cut, you can up these segments here. Um, let's do like three. So it'll just add some cuts and round it out even farther for you. Um, this is symmetrical, so or I want my version to be anyway. So I'm going to uh, divide this. Sorry, I have to control Z to undo. Oops. So I'm going to divide this actually first and delete this half add a mirror modifier, and then now we can do this bevel properly. Like so. Okay, that's looking really good. I want these to be smooth, so I'm gonna turn on auto smoothing, uh, which is under object data, 
normals auto smooth so that when I hit shade smooth here it will uh, shade anything that is uh, under 30 degrees I think it will shade it to or over 30 degrees it will shade smooth and uh, under it will shade flat or something like that um, which of course it's shading this one as flat because it's not meeting the threshold so you can either adjust your shape or you can adjust this right here to like 45 maybe now this will all be smoothed out okay um so i need to in inset these eyes a little bit here so the way that i'm going to go about modeling this is i'm going to divide this mesh in half horizontally which because I have beveled these edges this is now an end gone so I can't use my control R to cut a new edge loop in because it doesn't recognize this uh, face as being part of this so I can divide this face in half and then what I can do is uh, come in here select this edge right here right click subdivide and I've done it on the back too and then once uh, I have these points here, I can just hit J on the keyboard to join those faces and that will split, or join those vertices I should say, and then that will split this face into two. Um, yeah, so from here I guess we can do an inset. Hmm. This is um. As you can probably tell, as this is more bonus content, so I'm not um, doing a lot of testing beforehand. This is just sort of my natural workflow, so it's a little bit um, less scripted than some of the previous content. So you'll have to bear with me for some of this trial and error stuff, but it does give you an opportunity to see like what a real workflow would look like, and a lot of times that involves trial and error. Um, so I just did this sort of in a in the wrong order from from how it should be done. I should wait to do that corner bevel because uh, basically if I inset it right now, it would uh, have the inset would have sharp edges here and then a rounded corner, which is not what I want. I want all these corners to be rounded uniformly. So um, I, I just started over, which is no big deal. I hadn't gotten that far or anything. Um, so now I can select, I can divide this face more evenly and I can select this face and press I on the keyboard to inset to get these little uh, interior squares here. I can position them how I like and um, from here, I think from here I do want to bevel. So um, let's hit control B. Oops, not like that though. So I'm actually gonna I'm not, bleh. I'm going to in to extrude this inwards first actually. So I'm gonna hit E and pull it back along the Y axis here to get these little uh, eyes inset. So um, one thing to note when you're sort of doing extrusions such as this is that although you can see it in perspective and that is how we, we how we will be viewing it most of the time it helps a lot if uh, you can see that when I come into fourth or front orthographic view that this sort of disappears from the view because these faces are perfectly flat so uh, what can help a lot with visibility is just to scale these interior faces in ever so slightly so I just have this interior sort of extruded face I just hit S and scale it in. You can see that it's a lot more visible now with just a little bit of slant to those edges. Okay. I'm gonna inset it again. And um, to pull out these interior eye pieces, I'm gonna extrude it, but I'm gonna pull it forward this time. Uh, not all the way to the edge, just in a little, or out a little, I should say. I one more time to extrude, or inset, I should say, and E to extrude one more time. Okay, and then same thing with this face, I can scale it in slightly to help with the visibility, 
and uh, I'm gonna do the same thing for this edge loop. So um, just like that, this edge loop here, I can scale it out. And now we can see it even if we're viewing it from the front really easily. Um, let's, I need to add some like retaining, like a retaining loop here, if that makes sense. Um, because otherwise I will destroy my corners if I try to bevel these. So I'm gonna hit Alt and click and deselect these last little bits. And then I'm gonna hit Control B and bevel these out. Um, oops, not that one. I do wanna bevel it, but not just yet. Okay. Cool. <laughs> I think I need to move this in slightly though. For the nose, I should probably just save the bevels till the end. I don't know why I'm trying to bevel everything so soon. I'm just being impatient, I guess. Okay, let's extrude this face out for the nose. Is that how we want to do it? I have to think about how I want to do this. Hmm. Let's start with the mouth. That's gonna be easier. Maybe I can do something clever. Actually, let's try this first. And then let's snap these together. So it will form a triangle right here, but again, this is a static mesh object. Triangles are perfectly fine, and in fact, they our entire mesh will be triangulated uh, by Unreal automatically. I'm just subdividing and sliding that over because I want to merge these. And now I can bring these down so they're a little bit more even. I'm gonna bring them in a little bit more so we can see the nose. And at this point, I'm gonna bring up now, if I wanted this edge to be perfectly flat, the way that I would do this in Blender is to select the edge and then scale it in the direction of the axis that you want it to be flat in. So um, I want this to be flat in the Z direction. So if I hit S and Z and zero, um, that was super slight because I had it really close, but let me show you what it does. So if I had something like this and I wanted to flatten it out, I could select this edge, hit SC zero, and it would flatten the edge in the Z axis, which is really handy. Okay, well now let's do the mouth. The mouth should be pretty straightforward. So um, I need to inset this edge again, or this face again, but um, the eyes are individual from each other on the mirror modifier, so I could just hit I and scale it in, which you see is not gonna work for the mouth because now I have two and I have this sort of uh, face between them, which is not what I want. So to do this, we're still gonna hit I, but then we're gonna hit B to turn off boundaries, uh, and that will snap it to the edge of the mirror modifier for you. Super, super handy. Let's scale this up. I'm gonna grab this edge and bring it in till it's roughly the placement and the size that I want. I am gonna bring it down just a little bit because I think it looks better. Um, okay, so let's extrude this in. Now, uh, when you extrude in, when you perform an inset like that, you will have this face here, but you can just delete it and you should have everything that you need in the formation that you need it. Let's see, I need another edge loop that's going around the mouth here. Uh, and I'm just trying to even the width of these out a little bit now. 
uh, just using the standard transforms because I want to do this little uh, this sort of extrusion for the lips here. Let's extrude this out. Okay. So this is pretty good. Let's see what it looks like with a subsurf. <laughs> I kind of like that. Um, so a subdivision surface will smooth this all out, but I think I'm going to do this with beveling, even though I do, I do kind of like the result there. Um, so I am going to bevel these now. I know I've gone kind of back and forth on the beveling. I was just trying to find the best, uh, the best workflow that will destroy, will, that will leave me with the least amount of cleanup, essentially, is what I'm trying to do. Because uh, cleanup is uh, sort of tedious, and if you can avoid it, why wouldn't you? Oops, I accidentally have these ones selected. Okay. So I'm probably going to have some issues with this nose because I wasn't fully thinking this through, I guess, but no, it's okay, actually. Okay, let's try that selection with the bevel. That looks pretty good. Okay, and then we just need to do these corners. And you may get some like overshoot areas such as this um, that'll cause errors in your mesh. Um, this is what I mean by like cleanup. You just have to come in here and sort of fix it. All right, that looks pretty good. Um, we could even try, I'm not sure if this will work because our geometry at this point is fairly messy. Let's try to come around this. I'm just holding control to select the shortest path between two points. Um, can we bevel this edge is the question. Uh, yes, but we need to change some things about it. We probably want just one here and we want to clamp the overlap. No, we don't want to clamp the overlap. So basically the bevel operator works really well. However, if you have some areas of vertices that are uh, too close together or uh, not merged properly, uh, you can run into issues. So let me try to fix some of these now. We have sort of an issue here, but it looks like that one won't be too hard to fix. We just need to merge this point into this point. There we go. And I mean, this is a, this is a mess, but. Okay, let's turn auto smooth on and shade it as smooth. Oof. Definitely have some strange things happening here. Merging these points up because they're just not really doing anything for me. Let's see.
Okay, so I'm just controlling, control and Z a bunch of times to undo um, as I sort of experiment with the best way to build this. I'm just going to flatten that edge with scale Z and zero. Um, now this point and this point should merge because they have no purpose. That point and that point should merge. This point and this point should not merge because it's part of the nose. So I think I'm going to subdivide here and double top G to bring this over so that I can merge this up to this. And one, two, merge that to that. Same thing here. Now I have one, two, three, four, five points. Okay. So I do need that edge there probably. Um, what I'm doing here is marking where I want hard edges to be. So up until this point, we've basically been relying on auto smooth to do this for us, but uh, you don't have to use auto smooth. You can in fact do it like yourself. Um, so you can manually assign where you want to be shaded flat and where you want to be shaded smooth. Uh, it's just a little bit more work, but if the auto smooth algorithm is not calculating your faces the way you want them to, um, sometimes it's worth it just to assign it yourself. So anywhere that's like curved, like these sort of faces, I'm leaving it smooth and anywhere that's like this, I'm shading it as flat, essentially. Um, I'm just really bothered by this pinching in the corner and I'm spending possibly way too much time on it, but um, You know if it's distracting it's going to be an issue like if you if you can see it here It's gonna show up in your final uh, In your final asset, so it's worth it just to take the time to fix things like this uh, early on because it'll save you a lot of headache later on in the uh, in the build. I'm going to dissolve this vertex and this edge. So now I just have all these like free floating end gons but um, because I use the same number of cuts in theory I can just connect them this way and hopefully it won't be quite so uh, pinched. Just using the J key of course to join in such a way that the faces are now split properly. So this one um, I am going to leave at the single point but it's also not causing any pinching here so I'm not concerned about it but you can see that this corner looks a lot better already. So I'm going to do the same thing for, no, I'm not going to do the same thing here because I only have a single point here. So I probably could have just merged this. Let's merge this one down. Okay. So Let's see what this looks like if we don't have this marked as sharp. Uh, actually, let's just turn on auto smooth. So that looks pretty good. There's a little sharpness right here with this uh, corner that I don't particularly want. Uh, and I just pivot it over to the other side so I can see this unobstructed by the uh, edges that are drawn over it while I'm working with it. So um, the only thing to note is that when you are looking at the mirror of it, 
your controls are going to be reversed. So if I wanted to go left and if like based on this thing, I would have to move my mouse right because uh, it's mirrored, obviously. I think that looks pretty good. Um, so I guess we should probably do this little, I, I'm not gonna go in and do these little animal motifs. That's a little bit more complicated than I really uh, want to get for sort of bonus content. I am kind of trying to run through these pretty quickly, um, but I could do this little uh, sort of halo effect. How are we doing? We're, we're okay on time for this video, actually. <laughs> I think it looks pretty good. What is going on here? So I have some overshoot here from my mirror modifier, so I'm just gonna turn on clipping and grab it in the X direction to make sure that everything is uh, nice and tight and the seams are where they should be and everything is clipped together properly. Okay, so basically I want to mimic this shape so I can probably, I don't need these faces because they're gonna be against the wall So I think the way that I would go about doing this shape to keep the topology as easy to work with as possible is I would select this whole edge loop by uh, holding Alt and clicking on it. And um, I'm gonna just press Shift and D to duplicate it. And then I'm gonna hit S to scale it until it's about the height I want. And then I'm gonna scale it in the X until it's about like that. Um, and then from here, what I might do is rearrange some of these vertices so that they more closely conform to this shape. Although I do, looking at this now, um, I didn't round this out quite as much and I think I'm going to leave it square. I actually really like it. So I'm actually not gonna move these vertices at all because I want uh, them to match the curve of my main headpiece. So. I'm just going to have these back pieces selected and I'm going to hit E and S in orthographic view to scale them in a little bit and then scale them in on the X. Uh, because this is a non-uniform scale, when you extrude and, and inset and things like that, sometimes they don't inset um, sort of uniformly the way you want them to. So that's why I had to scale them additionally in, in the X direction. So I would do something like this probably. And um, then I can select this whole face loop and I can extrude it back. And let's make sure it's lined up properly. So if we think about like this being where the wall, this edge being where the wall is, we just need to move this piece forward. So I'm going to uh, select one part of it and press L to select linked. And then I'm gonna press G and Y to move it forward until it's lined up. And this, these faces aren't perfectly flat to the Y, but I can fix that. Um, so it's up to you whether you want to keep this as one object or separate them out, um, just whatever eases your workflow. Before we um, before we bring this into Unreal, we'll, we will join it all as a single object, but um, sometimes I find it easier to break up a single piece into its component sub pieces while I'm working with it. So um, to do that, I could select the linked uh, mesh. So just hovering, uh, highlighting one and then pressing L. We'll select everything that's linked to it. And um, from there, we can press P to get the separate menu and we can hit selection. And now everything that I had selected is now it's a separate object. And you can see that here in the hierarchy. So I will join this back in before I export it out, but um, for, for now, if I find, just find it a little bit easier to work with pieces sometimes when they're not, uh, joined together. 
Okay, so now we just need to make these little like uh, insets and I'm going to do those as separate pieces um, well they're gonna be more like floating pieces so I don't need to extrude directly out from this body and line everything up I mean I definitely uh, I could do that but I don't need to and I want to save myself some time here as well so I'm gonna delete the bottom half of this uh, ring sort of piece and I'm going to mirror it on the Z as well as the X. So now I only have to model one quarter of this. So clipping is still on, so I can just press G and Z and bring these down so that they clip together in the, at the line of symmetry here. Um, okay, so now as a separate mesh piece, I'm just gonna bring in a new cube. I'm gonna scale it and move it up, straight up in the Z and I'm going to uh, Shift D, duplicate it out to be the second one. And then I'm going to split it along the uh, line of symmetry here so I can add a mirror. And now I can just have to worry about this one corner and everything else will be duplicated across or mirrored across, I should say. Okay, these little connection pieces, I don't need the top or the bottom face of these because we're never going to see them. So I'm gonna delete them right now. And I'm gonna come into top view and make sure that this is just lined up with the rest of the mesh, like so. And the reason I duplicated out my cube first here is that I only have half of a cube here now and I just wanted the entire cube on this side. So I just duplicated it before I did the mirror to uh, account for that. Okay, same with these. We don't need the top or the bottoms. Let's delete them. And now we can just scale these in on the X. And I can grab this top edge ring and just put it up a little bit. Okay. So before I start matching this a little bit more. I'm going to duplicate it because it's easier to work with a squared off piece than it is with a piece that has like strange angles to it. Um, so I'm just going to duplicate these all the way around. So if I wanted to um, extend this basically in the direction I flipped it, I can't do that right now with the traditional transform tools because I'm working in edit mode right now. So if I were to say like G and Z, it would grab it in the Z. Um, so if I wanted to extend it basically along this line, all I have to do is double tap G to get the edge slide tool and then hit C and that is for continue and it will continue that out past the edge of the mesh there. Okay, I'm gonna duplicate that piece again and rotate this one just by 90 degrees. That one was easy. Um, I'm bringing these in to the edges here because it's, it's just not necessary to have it intersecting this much. It's just wasted space on your UV maps. Same thing, just duplicate these down. And if we hit Z on the mirror here, um, of course it will mirror it based on where its origin is, which is up here. Uh, so it's flipping everything up, but we can have it mirror based off of this piece. So if we select this and in the mirror modifier stack, grab the eyedropper and then select the main part, it will mirror based off of this. Um, of course this isn't perfectly centered, uh, but that's all right. We can, we can fix it. Um, if we just bring this piece down a little bit so it's a little bit more evenly distributed, now we can come up and grab these edges, pull them down, grab this one, double tap G, push it in, and then press C to continue, pull it in. And 
and I'm going to reset the um, the pivot on this because I moved it in object mode. So um, it's positioned at the world center, so I can just hit origin 3D cursor because that's where my 3D cursor is, and everything will snap accordingly. Um, so this is protruding much farther than I want from this. So I'm going to grab this piece, come into top view, and then I'm just going to grab everything in the front and grab it in the Y to scale it back a little bit. All right, so now if I needed it thicker for any reason, I could just scale everything in the Y. You know. Um, we also don't need these back faces if they're going to be against the wall, so let's go ahead and delete all of these. And these. So we just have sort of an open mesh on this end. Okay, um, I want to fix these pieces here before I join anything. So I'm basically just going to grab this in the X and move it out. And then the bottom, I'm going to grab it also in the X and move it in. So it just follows that curve a little bit more precisely. That looks a lot better. So the last piece I would do is I'd probably fill in a piece in the back here. So um, on this outer ring, I could uh, tab into edit mode and select this this edge here and just press F to fill it, which because of the mirror modifier kind of fills it in a funky way, but uh, it's no problem. We can fix that. Let's select this edge, right click, subdivide, and then we're just going to bring this to the center. So I'm going to hit G and then I'm going to hit shift Y to exclude the Y axis and bring it into the center until it clips together. Okay. So, um, this is our piece. We could maybe bevel these edges if we so chose to, but I like it. So um, let me just fix some of these shading issues. And easy enough. Um, and basically, we can join this whole thing together and uh, uh, UV unwrap it next. So uh, we're at about 40 minutes, so I'm gonna pause the video and finish this up in the next one. Okay, so we left off having just completed the modeling portion for this piece. So uh, now I wanna go about adding a texture to it. So. Normally what I would do is come in here and mark all my seams and get a nice, beautiful, uh, packed UV map, but that is only going to work if I plan on hand painting this piece or otherwise applying a unique texture to it. And um, in the interest of time, I want to use a tiling texture for this piece. So uh, rather than coming in and marking and packing these seams as uh, I would normally do for production, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a sort of uh, hacky way to use a tiling texture here. So um, again, this is more appropriate for like pre-alpha development and um, so, so take this all with a grain of salt. But what I'm going to do is come to my shader editor here and um, up here in my file browser, I've just navigated to the spot on my um, on my hard drive where I saved out those tiling textures we made earlier in the course. So if I wanted to use a tiling texture on a piece like this, um, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, I have it all set up in material here. So all I did was create a new material and drag these directly in. Um, I only have the base color and the uh, normal connected right now. We can add in the ambient occlusion, but as this is just sort of a look dev, um, this is sufficient for our purposes. So we need to fix the UVs here because obviously right now uh, this thing has no proper UVs and the texture is completely crazy. So uh, what I'm going to do is come into the UV editor here and I'm going to select everything by hitting A on my keyboard. And uh, I'm just going to come into front orthographic view here and I'm going to hit U and instead of unwrapping, I'm going to pick 
project from view. So basically what this does is it looks at uh, where your camera is in relation to your piece, and it's just going to project it flat on to your 2D UV space here. So I can scale this up now. And because I have my tiling texture applied, it's just going to tile it straight across those faces. Now you will run into some issues with this, with these uh, these faces that are flat from the orthographic view, but it is fairly easy to remedy this. Uh, all you really have to do is uh, select these faces. You may need to add some seams in here on these side faces, but let's um, let's mark a seam right here just to show you an example. And you can see here on the 2D side on the UV that they're completely flat, which is not going to give us accurate results, which is why it looks so stretched right here. So all you would need to do is to unwrap these. And if you have a more squared off object, it's even easier because you can just select the side, come into side view and project that from views. But I have these rounded corners that I have to contend with. So um, what I can do here is if I pull up the uh, base color. And now I can see how these are gonna relate. So what I can do here is rotate this to be the appropriate direction here. And again, because I'm using tiling textures, it is totally okay to overlap these UVs. You only really need to worry about uh, non-overlapping UVs if you are hand painting a unique texture. So, I mean, how detailed you want to get is up to you. You can come in and try to match the grout lines if you feel so inclined to do so. Um, I'm not going to worry about that too much. So, um, same thing for these ones. If we select all the sides here, um, let's do these ones and these ones. And if we come into the side here, because these are so flat, I can just project these from view as well. And um, they will all be projected as squares, as long as they're roughly lined up with the camera. So again, how much you wanna come in and match these is up to you, but. something more or less along those lines. And then I just have to do the same thing with these tops and bottoms here. So um, to get these projected, you can come and press seven to go to top view and um, that will give you a nice view of them. You can hit U, project from bounds, um, and then however much you wanna come in and arrange them on your sheet is uh, it's up to you. There are other things you can do to make this look a little bit better. You can uh, select certain areas and you can just offset them a little bit if it if that looks a little bit better for your particular texture. Like if these grout lines don't match up exactly with these, well that would be expected for a piece such as this. So I'm gonna add in another seam right here, right here, uh, so I can get this piece. and scale it up so it's about where it should be. Oh. I have an interior face here. So um, what I just did is I, I went to select this edge loop and it didn't select all the way around. And I know there's no triangles, so there must be an issue with the actual mesh itself. So it's because there's this edge loop right here or this interior face right here. So we don't want that. So we can delete it. And there's one on the bottom as well. We can delete that. Okay, so now when we alt and click, it should select the entire loop and it does. 
I think we do want to add a seam to this first. There we go. Um, where you put it is largely a matter of personal preference on something like this. So all I'm really doing, I'm not worrying too much about matching up the uh, grout lines or anything, uh, just because I'm not terribly concerned at this stage uh, getting these textures to be totally perfect. Uh, I just want to set this up to use a tiling texture, basically. Um, so I'm really just trying to eliminate these weird stretching lines and, and get them to be something a little bit more... Um, Logical, I guess, would be the term. I still have one going sort of around this way. Um, okay, so just take a look. So it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination here, but um, it, at least it avoids any major stretching. So uh, what I'm going to do is highlight everything. I'm going to come into this. UV window and I'm just gonna average the scale here and uh, again we're using a tiling texture so however big or small we want it to be it really uh, it's it's largely up to you and obviously you want to take some time on your own and like match up these grout lines to make it look a little bit better um, and you may even want to take the time to hand paint it I'm not going to in this case because uh, we already have a tiling texture that I think works and also if I use this um, it gives me an opportunity to show you how to uh, have a little bit more flexible materials inside of Unreal. So let's look at how to do that. So, um, yes, okay, so I noticed some weird shading right here. Uh, there's a discrepancy in the shading between this main piece and this back piece, and that's because the normals on this back piece are uh, incorrect. They're flipped backwards. So uh, if we wanted a preview of how this would render in our engine, we could turn off or turn on backface culling. So you can see that these are all uh, sort of flipped around the wrong way. So let's fix that. Um, you can also tell if you come into face orientation, um, your back faces will be shaded red. So I'm going to fix this really quickly. I'm just going to hit A on my keyboard, select all, and then shift and N to recalculate the normals. And now it should look uh, proper in our viewport as well as in Unreal. So let's turn off face orientation and look at it now. And now there's no difference in the in the shading between those two. And we can just double check here everything in the back and on the inside is red and everything that we're going to see should be shaded in blue with face orientation turned on. Okay, so um, again, not the most beautiful asset in the world, but uh, will definitely work for our purposes and I even scale that up down. Anyway, you can play around with the, the UVs and the tiling all you like. Um, I'm just going to pop this into Unreal so I can show you what's more important, which is how to adjust these materials a little bit more dynamically. So um, let's get this guy into Unreal. Um, let's check his dimensions first. Okay, so it's actually quite 
massive. It's like taller than a person right now. So I'm going to scale this down to, uh, I'm not going to be exact because I can always adjust it in the editor as well, but I'm going to scale it down to something like that. And let's apply the transforms and export it. Uh, call it, yeah, fountain, sure. Export. And now let's bring it into Unreal so I can show you what I mean about those materials. Okay, so here's our little guy. He looks great. Now uh, we can use a tiling texture with him because we set him up to use a tiling texture. And it looks decent, but everything in my temple is this sort of brown color and um, I want a little bit more variation here. So uh, I want to look about at how to go about doing that. I think I scaled him too small, but that's okay. I want to look about how to basically use these textures, but just give them a different color and um, being able to edit them dynamically here. So um, let's just place him in the level so we can see what is happening. And um, I'm going to um, come in here. Let me turn off my keystroke capture because it's sort of in the way of things. I'm going to come in here to my materials. And here is our wall material that we made. And we even set it up with some parameters to help extend the functionality and to allow us to switch out these textures for uh, different prop objects, like such as this Olmec head. It, this texture, this is, this material is a instance of this wall. So basically I've made these all parameters and now I can switch them out dynamically. So I just want to extend the functionality of this a little bit more. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the colors of this. So um, if we type in, if we or if we just hold three on our keyboard and click, we will get what is called a uh, vector here. And this is basically just uh, a three number vector such as we have been using in scripting. However, these can be represented as R, G, and B. So uh, a value of zero, zero, zero will give you black. And if you click on this bar right here, you can set the color at will. So I can set it to like something more blue, for instance. And that will give me the numerical values here. So what can I do now is I can um, sort of overlay this color onto our base color here. So um, let's try an overlay, blend overlay. Um, we want our texture to be the base and we want our color to be the blend. And let's preview the result here. So now we have sort of a blue color. And if I were to come in and change this color, um, we can we can change the, the tint essentially. So uh, if I make this, vector into a parameter, I can dynamically change the color in any material instance I choose. So um, as a default, I'm going to set it to white so that essentially, actually, I'm going to set it to 50% gray. So it essentially gives me this exact color. Uh, if you if you blend and overlay with 50% gray, it won't really change it. And if we right click on this color node now and convert it to a parameter, let's call it tint. Well, now if we save this, we now have this tint parameter here. So even for my Olmec heads, if I just needed to shift the color slightly, uh, if I wanted something more saturated, say, well, all I would have to do is come into the material parameter or the material uh, instance. And I can override this tint value and like well, if, if I wanted the more blue or more purple or a bright color, I could change them dynamically in the editor here. So that's really cool. Um, I'm going to leave my Olmec heads the way they are. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a ma new material instance from this wall piece. In fact, this is no longer really a wall. It's not descriptive. Let's call this uh, environment. So I've put MM for master material underscore environment. So now I can, anything that uses these basic environment maps that I'm using uh, for, for these pieces can use this as a master material. So let's create a material instance. Let's do M uh, wall tile one. 
And now let's change the tint of this to something in a cooler color. Uh, I'm gonna go not super saturated, but I just want it to be a little, a cooler gray. So I'm just gonna put a slight blue on this and save it out. So now I can use this material instance to just get some color variation here. And now these stand out from the wall a little bit more than they did before. There's a lot of other things that we can uh, do here with master materials and parameters. Uh, for instance, we can change the tiling. Um, if we put in a texture coordinate node, uh, this will give us access to U tiling and V tiling here. So um, basically, if we increase these numbers now, they should uh, tile. Well, we need to hook them up first to the UVs. If we increase these numbers to three, for example, we can tile these across the uh, across the surface at a, a greater or lesser density than we had before. So if I set these back to one, uh, we have this size. And if I set them to like three, we can tile them uh, sort of not non-uniformly across the surface as well. If we just wanted them to be thinner and longer, we could definitely do that. Um, but the problem now is how do I can't make this into a parameter. There's no uh, there's no option for that. So uh, what I need to do is make a what is called a scalar parameter. A scalar is just a single number value, unlike our vector, which gives us three numbers. If we press one on the keyboard and click, uh, we will be given a scalar parameter, which we can call something like tiling. Let's give it a default of one. Now if we hold M on the keyboard and click, we can get a multiply node. Uh, and if we connect this to this, and then connect these to our UV outputs, we can dynamically control the tiling of our textures here. So um, this is super useful, especially if you don't want to hop back and forth constantly. Like, um, for instance, if I saw this and said, oh, this looks great, but uh, the tiling is way too small for this piece, like the, the, the texture is too dense, we need to increase it. Well, I could do that by coming in and editing, you know, the UVs and scaling them down uh, till I get the right size and just do that via trial and error. Or what I could do is set up a more flexible master material such as this one. So now if I change this to three, you can see that it just automatically changes the tiling. So um, let's save this out. And now if we open our wall tile 01, we have this new tiling parameter here. So if I set this to 0.5 per se, uh, let me see if I can pull this out so you can see it happening in real time. So here I have my piece. Um, I can set it, to point, set it back to one. We have this level of tiling. I can set it to 0.5 to make it larger. I can set it to 0.1 to make it very large. Uh, it's, it's really up to you uh, and your own personal preferences here. So, um, let's try 0.45, I think looks pretty good. You can save that out. And uh, I'm going to lighten this a little bit so it stands out a little bit more. Okay, so um, let's quickly throw these into these, into this uh, blueprint and see how it looks. So I'm just going to actually going to leave it in the level just so as a scale reference. Like I like the scale, so let's try to match it. So I'm going to open my blueprint, my fire blueprint here. And I'm just going to replace this static mesh cube with our fountain asset, I believe is what we called it. Yeah, this one. Uh, obviously the scale is way off, so let's reset it. And uh, we're going to have to rotate this around within the blueprint itself. Also, um, again, because the boxes are parented to the static mesh, uh, we are not able to scale it. So let's unparent those and fix all of our scaling issues. And it is helpful to, if you have a second monitor, this is a really uh, a good use for it. But um, since I'm recording, I'll try to squish this all onto one monitor. 
So let's flip it around so it's the direction it should be. And let's move it up. Oh, we're upside down. There we go. Let's scale it till it's about the size of the one we have in the world. Okay. And now what we need to do is we just need to make sure that this particle spawn point is lined up with the mouth of our static mesh here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to parent the particle system to the mesh and leave the box unparented. So now I can freely move the static mesh around and if I do that the fire will move with it. Um, but what I need to do is line up this pivot point with the mouth here. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Let's compile and save, and we can close this out. We can delete this static mesh from our level, and now we have our little uh, pieces lined up against the wall. So let's make sure that they look okay in testing before we wrap this up. I'm gonna hit play from here. So the fire's a little large, and it's uh, kind of coming out of the nose and the mouth, but I think the way that I'm going to deal with this is to just scale up my mesh even farther. We have plenty of wall space to go around. There's no reason why it has to be this size per se. Let's scale that up and let's check our particle emitter point. It should stay the same, but maybe we can pop it down a little. Okay, let's check it again. Let's get rid of this annoying thing. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good. I almost died doing that. Let's pick a banana. Okay. So that's going to wrap it up. Um, I'm very pleased with this, at least as a sort of alpha asset. So um, in the next one, we're going to continue moving forward, uh, replacing these prototype meshes with some uh, actual art assets. All right, the next piece that I want to address is our big yellow button here. So um, let's look at what we're gonna do for this. As far as design goes, I went back to my reference board, of course, and I looked for things that would fit in a circular motif. I, of course, could have made my button square. It would not have changed the level dramatically, but we're already working with a, a circular one. So I, I found this image and I like it, it's simplistic, but it's got some visual interest into it. So we're gonna do these sort of simplified uh, sunbursts for our design. So uh, let's hop into Blender. I just have a new Blender file up. I'm just gonna delete everything because we're not even going to start from a cube. Uh, we are going to start from a cylinder. Um. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm gonna turn on snapping just to get it sort of a base level with, uh, with where we're at. Okay, so I want two pieces to the cylinder. I want the button itself that goes down, but I also want a sort of a border for it to go down into. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna duplicate this mesh and scale it up in the X and the Z axes, uh, not the I'm sorry, the X and the Y axis, not the Z axis, so it's the same uh, height here, and I just hit Shift Z to do that. I apologize, I keep forgetting to turn on my uh, keystroke capture at the start of these videos, but I, uh, I remember now, so that's what matters. Okay, so this is going to be my like sort of outer ring border, and then this is the smaller one is going to be my button. Um, so I'm going to start with the border. And um, I'm gonna delete this bottom face because it's never gonna be off the ground. And I'm gonna come in with this top face here in top mode. And I'm just gonna inset it. And we can even switch to wireframe to get this really tight into the button itself. We don't want there to be a big gap. Okay, so from here I'm gonna extrude downwards. And I still have snapping turned on, which is fine, but you can turn it off if you need to. And the next thing I want to do is I want to bring this one in slightly on the uh, X and Y axes here. 
And then we're never going to see this face because it's going to be underneath the button at all times, so we can delete this face. So um, I'm left with this shape, essentially. It's slightly scaled in, so if I were to come into top view, you can see it a little bit there. Okay, um, let's leave that for now and come to this portion. So same thing with the button, we're never going to see the bottom. So we can delete it. And then this, I'm just going to hit G and grab it up to uh, separate it. Let's shade these smooth. So I mean, this is the uh, essential form of our button. We're gonna add a little bit of detail here to make it visually a little bit more interesting. So I'm gonna bring in my reference down here. Let's go to image editor, open. Okay, so um, this is pretty uh, straightforward, and although this it reference is asymmetrical, I'm probably going to make mine symmetrical to speed things up. So I like to do all my circular insets before I uh, split this into a mirror modifier because uh, it's really hard to use the inset properly. Once you have this mesh split up, Blender doesn't really know how to account for the modifier. that so it doesn't block the uh, keystroke. <clears throat> um, a nice thing about Blender 2, I don't know if I've ever mentioned it explicitly, but uh, in case I haven't, uh, you can repeat your last operation by hitting Shift R. So my last operation was to shade my faces as smooth. So I can do that across everything by just making my selections and hitting Shift R. Okay, so um, I've done all my circular insets and I just want to need to do these little pie slices now. Now because of the nature of this cylinder and how it's constructed as a primitive, I already have my little pie slices here, uh, but I can speed this process up a little bit if I uh, break this down into a mirror modifier. So I need to join those faces together so I can split that. And make sure you do your box selections in wireframe, otherwise you won't select through the entirety of your mesh. Okay. Um, I don't want them to be quite this long. I want them to be a little bit shorter, so I'm going to add in sort of a end loop right here. And I do want a little bit of a border between here, this, this extrusion, and where these little uh, really inlays, I don't know what to call them, where these little wedges start. So we need another border right here. Mm. So I'm going to select them to be too wide, and on the line of symmetry, I'm only going to select one because it's going to be mirrored, so it will be too wide as a result. And of course, I have the wrong number of faces to do this. I can, I mean, it's asymmetrical in the picture. I guess I can live with it being asymmetrical in 3D as well. Okay, so now I want to scale these in so that when I'm viewing this from the top, I can see them properly. Uh, but if I were to do that now, uh, that's not really a good result. So the way I would go about this is to change my pivot point to individual origins and then scale. Oops. 
Um, of course, it did scale away from the line of symmetry in the <clears throat> when we did that. So, and we also have these interior faces, which we do not want. So, I'll uh, disable, and then we can delete these. And then, if we enable clipping, grab it in the X. a uh, bevel modifier will uh, sort of programmatically bevel all your edges. Uh, we've talked a little bit about beveling, uh, but we've not really talked about the modifier because I find it a little tricky to use, but it can give you a good, a good preview uh, that allows you to see things a little bit more clearly. And if your uh, object is low poly enough, such as this one, which is currently uh, 395 triangles, um, it, you can even have the bevel in your game mesh, uh, which will help a lot. So um, you could always do that and enable something like Nanite, uh, which I can show you how to do in a moment here. Okay, this one is just looking a little bit boring compared to the button now, so I'm going to uh, embellish it a little. Okay, so I've just made a selection of some edges. I'm gonna sort of break these up into individual bricks by uh, beveling out a little a little grout here, and then we can extrude it in. Um, and I didn't do that along the line of symmetry because beveling along a uh, sort of open edge like this uh, can get a little weird. So, and it usually just causes more problems. So I usually just add these edge loops in manually afterwards. Of course, you do have to account that they will be double wide, so we need to move this this edge loop in a little bit. But, uh, let's line this up first and delete these interior faces. Make sure you enable clipping there. And then um, I've lost my little face loops here, but um, I can solve this really easily if I select both these edge loops with Alt and I can right click and clip, uh, bridge edge loops there. And then same thing on that side. OK. 
okay, we to even that out. So now we have sort of like a curved bricks going all the way around, which is just a little bit more interesting to look at than, uh, than we had what we had going on before. So that's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Um, so yes, let's, uh, let's get this UV unwrapped and get a texture on it in the next video. Okay, so we are going to resume our button uh, build in this video. So I have here my low poly version that we created with our modifiers. So I'm gonna do a little bit of cleanup on this because I noticed we have some uh, faces that are sort of unnecessary down here in these little crevices. So um, I'm going to isolate the uh, just this outer piece by hitting the backslash on my keyboard. And I'm going to turn the visibility of my bevel modifier off for the time being so I can really address what's going on here because sometimes it's difficult to see when things start to get beveled. So I'm just deleting these extra faces. And because this is going to be my low poly version, I actually don't want to use the bevel for this. I am going to use it probably on the high poly version though, but we'll add it back in. Fixing the smoothing there just by turning on auto smooth here in the object data and then um, right clicking in object mode and shading it smooth. Okay, let's bring back our first piece and same thing. We don't need the bevel on the low poly. It just helps with visibility a little bit, but uh, it creates a lot of extra faces. This one looks pretty clean actually. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna duplicate this entire collection just by right clicking. And this is going to be my high poly version that we're gonna do a little bit of sculpting on. So let's uh, uncheck our low poly for now and just work with our high poly. Now remember that we're gonna sculpt, so the mirror modifier is not gonna work. So to uh, not lose any information, let's just apply those. And let's put on a multi-res. So if you don't want to lose the definition of these uh, sunburst pieces too much, you can crease the edges. Um, so all you have to do is select them and hit shift E uh, to bring up the crease slider. And then if you want it to crease all the way, you just hit one for a full value of one and that will make these edges nice and sharp. I'm just comparing these to uh, the uncreased ones. And to get these corners, we'd also have to crease these edges as well. So shift E one. Um, if you wanted to keep those tight edges, I actually think they look a little bit better rounded out. So I'm going to uncrease them by selecting all my creased edges and hitting shift E and then negative one. And that will get rid of your crease. It's also possible to do a partial crease. I typed in 0.45 there for like a just under halfway crease. So I definitely don't want the full crease, but I'm just kind of experimenting with 
other value ranges here. I mean, that's pretty good. That gives me a nice sharp line, but without being uh, looking unnatural. I'm doing here is experimenting with different values for the crease. 2.5. That's pretty good. It gives us a little bit more definition. So let's put a, a crease of 0.25 all the way around. And we can maybe speed this up a little by selecting all our sharp edges. That's a little bit better. We have some strange shading going on here because this is an end gone and um, Basically, the multi-res is not quite sure how to subdivide this, so we can um, come in here and clean this up as well. Um, and I'm going to try to keep this as evenly quadded as I can. There are definitely other methods for creating uh, quadrilateral faces on an N-Gon, but I find that they tend to be somewhat error prone, at least the, the automatic versions do. And if you don't have too many points to connect, sometimes it's just better to do it yourself. Now we're not seeing as much pulling right here. A little bit here because these faces, although they're quadrilateral, they're kind of a, a, a strange shape, but um, definitely a reduction in the, in the pull there. I believe we got these ones as well, but let's just double check. I'm just giving these center ones a slightly stronger crease because uh, I just don't think 2 point, 0.25 is quite enough. And it is slightly asymmetrical because of the uh, way our circle was in the last video, but that's okay. It is asymmetrical in our reference as well. Okay, let's jump into sculpt mode. And let's just see how, I'm just checking the density here using the draw brush. We can also check our density uh, numerically here. We have 113,000 faces. It's probably not quite dense enough for the detail I wanna add, but um, let's start with doing some like chunkier damage uh, around this and then we'll do our high res. So um, for scraping off like corners and things, I like to use the scrape brush. So I'm just gonna come in and sort of give all these like corners a little bit of wear.
Okay, let's divide a couple more times. We're at about 500,000. I find that a million tends to give you a decent level of surface detail without completely crashing your computer, uh, depending on your build. Okay, let's bring in an alpha on the draw brush. I'm going to duplicate it here, make a new texture brush, let's look at texture. And I have this KD Rock 09 from the Pixelogic Resource Library, which I discussed in a previous video. And I'm gonna set the default to negative for this brush, meaning we're pushing in. And we're gonna drop the strength a little bit to give it some surface texture. Oh. Control Z to undo that because I need to change my spacing a little bit here. We tried 25 last time or 50 maybe. Oops. Did I lose my texture? Oh, I think I undid through my adding my texture in accidentally. You'll notice there's some um, stretching of the alpha right here. This is because my underlying geometry doesn't really have um, even squared off faces. The, these faces are elongated and rectangular. So um, if we kind of erase that with the smooth brush, let's come back into object mode and let's go to drop our level viewpoint down to zero. or one or so, there we go, zero. Um, and if we tap into edit mode, see how these faces are all very rectangular compared to these. So it's not being subdivided evenly when we hit the multi-res here. So we can add some uh, control loops in here to divide it up properly. Um, so if you're noticing stretching, especially with any like alpha textures, this is a great way to fix it. So um, this is far from perfect, but um, it will sort of alleviate that because now when we subdivide on the multi-res, um, it will subdivide more evenly across the entire surface. So let's come back up to six. I suppose our level doesn't have to be that high for object mode, but it should be for sculpt mode. So now we're not seeing that stretching anymore. touch.
I think that's good enough. I'm going to drop the level viewport down on this just to uh, save on a little bit of performance, I'm getting a little bit of lag uh, when I pop between things, but uh, the sculpt is all still there, even though I've lost a little bit of detail in the viewport. I'm going to bring back my outside piece. Don't forget to save your work. Okay, same thing here. Um, we can add our multi res. And um, if we have any faces that are uneven, now would be the time to subdivide these a little bit. I think these are going to be okay, though. Maybe just one across the top for these. Okay, let's go into sculpt mode and let's start subdividing. And again, if you want to crease these edges to get a sharper point, uh, you definitely can. I kind of like these a little bit rounded. Let's just see how it looks with a slight crease, though. Maybe 0.2. Maybe one here as well. 50, 0, 0.2. Um, the strange thing about the crease uh, through just numerically typing in is it does appear to be additive. So um, if I were to type in 0.5, it would be 0.2 plus 0.5. So to clear it out, just do shift E minus one and then add your value in because uh, minus one is, is the lowest value it can go. see if these look better or worse with the crease. That's a little bit too high, I think. So I'm going to clear it out by uh, typing negative one and then shifty point maybe three. I'm going to delete this edge loop here because of the subdivision issues I was talking about, how if you don't have your uh, faces subdivided relatively evenly, sometimes you get some strange results. Okay, let's try to speed this up a little bit. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Um, let's view this by itself. We're at about 32 or 16,000 faces. Um, so we need a few more subdivisions here. Let's, we're at about uh, 64,000. Let's try to do that damage and see if we have enough resolution for it. Again, with the scrape brush coming in and just coming around these corners and making them a little bit more planar.
Okay, so now we're gonna do the uh, surface texture. So we need to subdivide, I think maybe two more times, to about a million. And let's grab our texture brush, which we still have. And all the settings should be the same. that's pretty good if you want to come in and take the scrape brush again and just like smooth out kind of chunky areas it can also give it a more natural feeling because um, sort of flat surfaces of stone tend to be more worn and so they'll have less of that sort of bumpy texture but uh, I think this is good enough for our purposes so let's bring back our button. So this is going to be the whole high poly sculpt. Um, again, maybe not the best sculpt in the world, but I think it'll work. Okay. Okay, so I'm not gonna bake this from the multi-res because I've already done some extra subdivisions and things like that on the low version. So I'm just gonna bake it from selected to active the way we have for our other pieces. So um, we are uh, done with our high poly for right now. So let's go ahead and hide it. And let's bring back our low poly because we still have to unwrap our UVs for this. So let's jump into the UV editor. And if you're ever unsure of where to start with UVs, um, one good trick that I haven't really discussed so far in this is to use the Smart UV Unwrap. So um, I'm actually first going to apply my mirror modifier because I don't want the uh, textures to be mirrored. I want them to be unique across the surface. But um, I use this pretty sparingly. Uh, it works better with simplistic objects such as this one. It's not so good with organic such as characters, but there is this option here if you press U on your keyboard for a smart UV project. Um, so it will look at the shape of your object and try its best to auto unwrap it for you. So I tend to use this more as a jumping off point than a final result, but if the object is very simple, sometimes it, it works really well. So you'll get this little um, dialog box, asks you how far you want your margins and things like that. Um, so let's just say okay. And this is the result of this entire piece. So this is actually pretty good. It does need a little bit of cleanup though. So what we can do here is that you'll see it hasn't created any seams on our island. So if we wanted to see where our seams were, we could highlight everything in our UV editor and come up and say uh, seams from islands. So now we can see them. So you can see that there's some issues with, with how it projects this, like it got a little confused around this edge. So this is not a very clean seam. So I would come in and clear this up and clean this up now. So it was just around that edge. Um, same thing here, I think, that's actually okay. So there's like a seam here and then one here, but it makes more sense just to cut straight across the entirety of the uh, this loop right here. And then same thing with these around here. So if you hold Control, Shift, and Alt, it'll select the ring. Oops, I to clear seams. And I'm clearing these because I want I do want a seam here, but I just I want it to be a little bit more precise and lined up with the rest of the mesh. Which I think 
I'm gonna clear this one as well. So we have one that's lined up with the world axis, which I just like because it, it looks very clean. Okay, let's see what our new UVs look like. Okay, this is pretty good. I am going to do a little bit more cleanup work on this using an add-on called Text Tools. Um, this is a third-party add-on, uh, so you will have to download it from the internet if you want it. You can just search Blender Text Tools. It will bring you up to a GitHub page. Um, in fact, let me just show you that right now. So if you just search Blender Text Tools, Text Tools, uh, it'll bring you this GitHub page. You can come and download the latest release here. It will give you a zip file. And um, it, you don't have to unzip it. You just have to go to Edit, Preferences, and then click on the Add-ons menu. You just have to click Install. Locate wherever your .zip file is and hit Install, and it will install it. And then from there, you just need to enable this checkbox, and you will have that there. Um, this is not totally necessary. There are other ways to do this, but for me, this is um, a great way to clean up UVs. This is a really useful tool, um, and it's totally free to use. So um, the one thing that I use it for the most is for uh, cylindrical layouts like this. Um, whenever we have pieces that are slightly curved, we can increase the use of our UV space here if we straighten them out. So. We can hit rectify on these and they will straighten out and then we will be able to pack them a lot tighter. out the scale because sometimes the process of laying these flat kind of messes with the scale a little bit and then we can pack our islands so this one's probably a little bit too long we should divide it so let's see which face which loop this is it's this one going around here so we do need a seam right there and also this this edge loop is a little bit unnecessary So let's lay out this one again. I'm just gonna lay out this one because I don't wanna lose all the rectifying I've done already. Oh, and I've divided it unevenly. Let's fix that. So instead of doing it here, because then we have one very long seam and one short one, I should just have two short, two two seams of equal size, two islands of equal size. There we go. So I think we only edited these three. much more efficient use of our UV space here. I'm not quite done with this yet because I want the both of these pieces, although they're going to be separate pieces because we need to animate them separately, I want them to share UV space so I only need to make one material for them. So um, we're not quite done with this yet. Let's again apply our mirror. Oops, not duplicate it. We're gonna apply it because um, I want the surface of the stone that I sculpted in to um, not be mirrored across this the uh, surface of my low poly. So same thing, we can start with a smart UV uh, project just to see what we get. This is kind of a mess though, so I'm actually not going to even bother making seams from this. And I'm just gonna do it by hand.
So normally I would put a seam here and a seam here because that's what has lined up with the world. Um, these edge loops are, however, are unnecessary. They are not doing anything but costing us performance. But I want to tuck the seams away sort of in these crevices where we are not going to see them as much. So I'm going to actually gonna put my seams right here. I'm going to do one on the other side. And then we do everywhere that we have it over a uh, 90 degree angle, we do need to have a seam, otherwise it will not shade correctly. So let's select uh, our sharp edges here and mark them as seams. And we will end up with a lot of little tiny islands. Sometimes that's just unavoidable based on your shape, but at least we won't have these big things. Well, I guess we still will. From scale. I just got an error message down here that said my uh, scale was not uniform, which results in some uh, interesting shaped UV islands. Okay, let's average our scale. And then to get them all packed on the same sheet, all we have to do is uh, shift select both of them in the viewport and then go into edit mode and select everything. And now we can average our scale one more time and pack our islands. And I think that margin may be a little bit too large. Let's try 005, that's a little bit better. It's sort of a trade-off between not wanting to waste too much space in between, but also um, not wanting them to be packed too tightly together. Okay. We can always double check this by putting a UV grid on it. All we have to do is enable it here, base color. And what I'm doing here is the exact same as what we do in the uh, graph editor. You see it's just added a new texture. It's just a little bit of a shortcut for, um, if it's something very simple, you don't need to pull up the shader editor. Okay, that looks roughly uniform. I think we're good. Let's get rid of that. Actually, instead of getting rid of it, let's just get rid of the UV grid on it and we'll make this our material. Okay, so we are going to pause the recording right here and when I come back, we are going to bake out our uh, normal maps, our AO, and then do a little bit of texture painting for this. All right, so we just finished up our uh, UV maps for our low poly version. So let's jump right in and bake up our sculpt onto this. So again, this should all be pretty much review at this point. So one thing that I am going to do is that when sometimes when you have two separate objects that are very close together in our world space, you can get sort of an error uh, when you're baking out your normal maps. And um, we saw this a little bit with our character, how certain areas were very close together, like the uh, crevices between the fingers. Uh, we caught a lot of artifacts from our bake, but luckily for objects, um, that are separate, what we can do is what is called exploding the mesh. So um, all you have to do to do this is to grab your objects that are separate and move them away from each other in the world space. So I'm gonna move this button piece away from this border piece. However, I need to keep the high poly and the low poly version in the same, occupying the same physical space, but we're just gonna move it away from these pieces. So I just selected my high and my low poly here, and I'm just gonna hit G and Z and bring them up. 
So now when I go to bake, we won't get any errors around this area that was tucked into this border. And then before we export it, we'll just tuck it back in. So I need my file browser open. Okay, so um, let's select our normal here change our render engine to cycles, our device to GPU. I'm gonna turn our samples down until we know our settings are correct. And we're going to change this to normal. Select it to active. Let's put our extrusion up to, let's say 0.1, or max ray to maybe 0.2. We'll see how that looks. And uh, the margin we definitely want to take down to maybe two to four pixels because we have our UV islands packed so tight. With margins this size, um, we're going to get some bleed over onto our, onto our other UV islands, which we don't want. Okay. So the way that I would go about this, um, to get this a, as a clean bake, Either uh, join your objects together and separate them out again uh, when you're done, or you can uncheck clear image for your second bake. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, because we're doing selected to active, we can really only have one active object in our scene at a time. So if I were to select these and then these, one of these would not be the active uh the active item, which would affect the bake. So I'm gonna do these one at a time and I'll show you, I'll show you how that works. So we have our high poly selected, we have our low poly active, so let's just hit bake. Okay, I paused a little bit because it took a couple minutes, but um, here is our bake. Uh, it's not perfect, we're having some issues right here with our extrusion distance, but um, let's check this out. I'm gonna come into wireframe. So it looks like um, our low poly is significantly above our high poly for these issue, these uh, sort of sunbursts here. But let's view it on there to make sure that it's, this might just be a UV unwrapping. Um, not issue, but it, it might look like there's, there's uh, artifacts that aren't actually there. And of course our color space is incorrect. So let's save this because we cannot edit the color space currently until we save this externally. So let's go ahead and save this as a And then now that's no longer grayed out, we can change this stack to non-color. Okay, so there are some artifacts and we'll look at how to clean those up in just a second, but more importantly, what I want to show you is how to now bake this part onto the same texture sheet without losing this information. So let's select our high poly for our border, our high poly, our low poly for our border. Make sure we have this normal map selected here in the uh, node editor, and we need to uncheck clear image here so that our um, this pe these pieces can just be baked on top of this without losing any of this information. So let's go ahead and hit bake one more time. Okay, so just took a couple minutes and here is our final result. And you can see it has just added these pieces on top of the pieces that we already had baked out. So uh, we can visualize this now if we connect this up and let's get rid of our low poly's visibility so we can see it. And um, this is our result. So we're still having some issues uh, cleaning this up and things. There are certain areas that um, the corners are, are very noticeable. Uh, but this is a pretty good bake and this is just a matter of tweaking it slightly. So um, let's look at making some of those tweaks. So I'm going to hide the button portions and I'm just gonna look at the border right now. So um, basically what is happening is that our corners are too far away from 
our high resolution sculpt. So we just need to uh, bring those in a little bit closer. So the way that I'm going to do that is to select these outer edges here. And I'm just going to hit Control and B to bevel them so that they're a little bit more We can bring them in closer to the, the profile of the high poly here. I'm gonna do the same thing on the inside. Okay, and now let's hide the border and let's bring back the button and look at any places where we're having issues. So let's go into wireframe because that makes it easy to see. And it looks like the same thing here, basically, um, around the tops of these, these edges right here. If we were to select all of them around and bevel them a little bit, uh, we'd probably get a cleaner bake. So let me just double check by hiding that and coming into here. Yeah, so you can see that there's some issues with these corners being too far away. So this is why we need to have our high poly and our low poly uh, occupy the same space in uh, our 3D scene. Uh, because if they're not, it, that's how it bases, that's how it finds what to bake to. So if you have them not aligned, your bake will not be aligned either. the high poly to make sure that we don't go too far. Let's get this a slight bevel. Okay. Now it's created all these extra UV islands here, so uh, we need to fix that. Because I beveled from a spot that had a seam, now we also have these as all separate islands and it's probably going to mess up our UVs. Okay, let's double check our UV map to make sure nothing got too crazy. Okay, that looks okay to me. And also if we shade this whole thing smooth and make sure that this is shaded smooth as well. We have auto smoothing on for both of them, so you may not see a change depending on the angles you're working with, but um, I find that the best results happen if you smooth your low poly mesh, otherwise you'll see some faceting in your normal map, some hard lines, and um, that is just to correct for the sharp edges that you have going on in your low poly. So if you smooth it first, those sharp lines in your normal map will go away. So um, this is a good opportunity, since I have to bake again anyway, to show you the other method of baking two separate objects together, which would be to join them first. So um, I could take the border and the button here in my low poly and hit Control and J to join them as one piece here. Um, so now if I were to tab into edit mode, they're all a single unit and I have them moved away from each other. And I can do the same thing with the high poly here. So I have the border and the button selected, Control J to join them. This might take a little bit longer depending on how dense your high poly is. So now I can bake them together in a single baking pass. So I'm gonna pull up my shading window again. And I'm gonna disconnect this normal map here for now and select it in the viewport or in the uh, shader viewport. And now I'm gonna uh, select my high poly and then control select my low poly. And we can hit bake again. One thing I forgot to mention is if you do it this way, make sure you turn clear image back on, otherwise you'll get a strange result. 
So uh, with clear image on, we're going to hit bake. Okay, so here is our fully baked result. We did it in one pass. Let's make sure we save it. And we can uh, connect it back up to look at the results. Okay, there's still some artifacts here, um, which you can fix by tweaking uh, your values for your extrusion distance here and your max ray distance. Tweaking those values will help get rid of these artifacts. So um, I'm gonna pause the recording and do a little trial and error and see if I can't uh, clean this up a little bit more. Okay, so um, this was my final normal map bake. Uh, my settings, I set the extrusion to 0.05, the max distance to 0.3, and the uh, margin to four pixels seem to give me the best results. There's still some artifacts here. Um, you can match this corner a little more tightly. And there's a little bit of artifacts in here, but you can go and fix those in Photoshop uh, the way we discussed in previous videos. But uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward with this. Um, also, if you find yourself having to do a lot of trial and error and it's taking a long time, uh, it's totally fine to make a smaller version of your bake first for testing until you get these settings right and then bake out to a 4K texture. Um, if you are using 4K. Otherwise, you'd find to use 2K for your final build as well. So um, I'm going to delete my 2K testing texture and I'm going to bake my AO. So I'm just going to hit Shift D in the nodes to duplicate this out. And from here, I'm just going to create a new ambient inclusion texture. And we're gonna do the same thing here for the bake. So we have our high and our low selected. Um, I'm gonna keep all the settings the same. We will have to up res our samples for this one, but uh, until, we make, until we know that these settings are gonna work, let's keep it at one for now. Okay, so also make sure you change your bake tab to ambient occlusion before you do this. This is our test bake results. Um, these look pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and up res to get rid of all this noise and we will see what our final result looks like. So I'm just gonna come up here to our max samples and change it back to 4K. And let's hit bake. All right, so here is our final ambient inclusion result at 4K with the full samples. So let's go ahead and view it on our model just to be sure that everything looks good. So um, again, we have some artifacts here with the corner right here. We can match a little bit more closely. And right here, I would probably come in and fix these in Photoshop, but um, other than that, this is looking good. So uh, we're gonna pause the recording right here and when we come back, we are going to uh, texture paint this. All right, so in this video, we are gonna texture paint our base color in for this piece. So let's hop into our texture paint and uh, we need to add a base color. Um, let's make it the same size as our other textures. And let's give it sort of a greenish gray base just to speed things up. I don't think we're gonna need an alpha channel. Okay. So once again, I'm gonna hop into our material preview and I wanna make sure that everything is set up properly, which it is not, because I had my ambient inclusion plugged in. So I'm just going to add a mix RGB.
Okay, so let's put our base color right here. We just have a solid color, so of course we want to add some variation in here. Um, let's first save our default color. That one. Okay. And let's give it some variation. So I'm going to push this a little bit warmer to like something like a darker taupe. Um, I'm going to reduce my strength. And now I'm just going to paint over the entire surface of this to give it some color variation. we need to come into our base color here to be able to paint on that. And let's do one more pass in more of a blue tone. Just went over it one more time with a neutral gray just to uh, soften the effect a little bit. But there's still that variation in there. So now let's pick a color for our shadows. Let's start with this base green. I'm going to drop the value and maybe the saturation just a little bit. Brush size is a little large and maybe a little strong.
So all I've done just now is separate this piece back out so I can better control what I'm painting. So now if I want to paint on just this piece, I just need to select it in object mode and then go into texture paint. And now it won't paint on this piece next to it. All right, so I think that's a pretty good rough base color pass. Again, there's some artifacts happening in the uh, in the grout there, but uh, I'm running short on time for this piece, so I'm gonna call it good right here, and uh, let's get this into Unreal. So uh, make sure you save out your image. Let's call it G button BC for base color, and save it. And um, when we come back, we will get this up and running in Unreal Engine. Okay, so we have our button pieces here. I have already separated them out back into their original components. Uh, we can name them whatever we like to keep it straight. Um, so now let's look at how to get these into Unreal. So the first thing we want to do is check our scale. So these are two meters across, so these are pretty large. So uh, let's fix this first by scaling it down a little bit. Um, and since I moved this around, the pivot point is in the wrong place. So I'm just going to set the origin back to the center of the world. And let's scale this back down to like maybe one meter-ish. Somewhere around there. Um, and let's apply all our transforms. Okay, so um, because this piece needs to move independently of the border, um, as per our blueprint in Unreal, we need to keep these two pieces separate and bring them in as separate pieces in Unreal Engine. So um, let's do the button first. So just select the button, file, export, FBX. Uh, choose a location. Let's call this button underscore border. Uh, make sure you have selected objects and export. Oops, we exported this under the wrong name, of course. That's confusing. Just do it again with the correct name. 
export. And then same thing with this as a separate file, we're going to file export. I'm going to overwrite this because this is the name that I wanted to use. Okay. Um, save all your work, save all your textures and let's hop into a project in Unreal Engine. So this is the piece we are trying to replace, of course. So let's come into our mesh folder and bring in our new mesh pieces. Uh, we have our button and our button border. Let's open those up. And um, of course, we're not going to bring in the textures or anything. We're going to bring those in manually. Let's just make sure this looks right. Before we do anything else, let's just pop this in there. Okay. So with the border and everything, I think it'll be okay. And this amount of scaling is not going to have any negative effect if we want to scale it up a little bit. So let's bring in the textures. Uh, this one, this one, and this one. And then they are. Let's set up our material, same way as before. So we're going to use the, uh, the master environment material here, and we are going to create an instance and call it button. Now let's just override these uh, basic materials here with our new textures. Uh, here's our base color, our AO, and our normal. Uh, we want to keep the tiling the same and everything. And we can tint it later if we so choose to. I'm going to leave it at the default colors. So we just want to give this, this button piece um, and the border piece the same material. Let's just drag that in. Okay. So that all looks pretty good. I don't see any um, egregious errors, at least none that I didn't already know about and didn't have time to fix. Um, so let's bring this into our blueprint. So let's open up our BP underscore button blueprint. Now this blueprint, if we go to the viewport, only has one static mesh object right here, which is uh, for the button. So let's use the uh, button mesh to replace it. Reset this, reset that. So that looks pretty good. Um, we can scale it a little bit if we want to match it to exactly where it was. We can scale it along these two axes. So we just need to add a second static mesh component for our border. So let's go into components, static mesh, and let's call this a uh, border. Now, if you have a static mesh selected in your content browser, when you add it, it will add that one automatically, but that was not what I wanted. So let's just swap it out. And all we have to do is move and scale this to the appropriate size here. Okay, let's test this out in game. Um, because we replaced the static mesh component, all of our references for our animation should still work. Uh, this is just a new one, which doesn't need to move at all. So uh, let's look at what this looks like in game. Already that's looking a lot better. Let's right click and play from here. Our button still moves down, it moves up, and our gate still opens. All right, so um, that is gonna conclude this video series on replacing this piece here. So I will see you all in the next video. All right, so we've just finished our button piece. We just really have two more prototype pieces to go, uh, one for the gate and one for the treasure chest here. I'm gonna make these as quick as possible because I know that uh, these sort of asset creation and replacement videos are getting a little uh, samey. So um, again, you have all the tools you need and all the skills you need from previous videos to do all these on your own. Uh, these videos are more just for those of you who are curious about my workflow and how I might go about creating some of these different types of pieces. So uh, we're gonna fly through these pretty quickly because um, I don't wanna take up too much time repeating uh, content. So um, let's, let's tackle the gate really quick in this video. So uh, this is one solid mesh piece. If we open up the uh, blueprint, we can see this mesh 
Actually, we should open up the prototype. Um, it's just one solid piece, so I just want to replace this with a super simple, like, uh, metal texture. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do for that is um, export this. So I'm going to right-click on the prototype, Asset Actions, Export. Um, locate wherever you want to do it. Name it Gate, that's fine. Make sure Collision is unchecked and export. Um, here's my button piece again. Let's just make sure I save that and we can bring this into a new file. Some people like to have all the uh, objects for their scenes in a single file. I tend to like to have them separate because when I have high poly versions and things like that, your performance really slows down when you have a lot of objects in here. So I'm going to have them separate. And gate, and then, right, it's already at the correct size and all that, and um, the correct pivot point, although the pivot point isn't really ideal for a type of piece like this, um, it will match our, our gate here, because it's right there. Uh, we can move it around and then move it in the level as well, though, if we, if we so chose. All right, so um, I want to make this a little bit less blocky. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually get rid of these triangles. So I'm going to come into edit mode, uh, select everything, and do tries to quads just to get rid of those faces. So what I can do now is add a subsurf modifier on this. And um, to get rid of these errors that occur with these points, we just need to crease these edges. So uh, in wireframe, shift E in one, and now we have round uh, ends up here. So we just have to do that with all the edges where they're meeting that point. We'll do it in edge select mode though, so I don't get any errors. Shift E in one. Okay, I mean, you can divide this as many times as you feel is appropriate. I'm going to get rid of these sharp edges as well. Um, all these blue lines are edges that are marked sharp, so I'm just going to hit A to select everything and uh, right click in edge select and clear sharps. Okay. So we do have auto smooth turned on for everything here. Um, there should be some faces that are flat, like these ones should be marked as flat, uh, shade flat. So then you'll get that proper shading right there. So, um, this is all I'm really going to do for this gate mesh. Um, what I'm going to do for the material is something uh, even even simpler than what we have been doing up until this point. The, the unique textures and the hand painting definitely takes the longest. But um, first I'm going to apply this modifier so I have all my information in here. And um, let's do a, a quick UV, a smart UV unwrap here, which will give us something like this. Um, I don't want them quite that close together. So let's pack 2.01 to use a little bit more of our texture space here. Um, and then we can optimize this just a little bit because these edge loops going around aren't doing anything for us currently. They're just increasing the performance cost. So we'll make these single faces um, because there's no seams there or anything. Uh, we can get rid of this one as well and this one as well. So it hasn't really changed anything about our mesh, it's just uh, optimized it a little bit. Okay, so this is my super, super duper simple gate. Uh, let's bring this into Unreal because it's got its UVs now and it's ready to go. And it's all at the right size and the right pivot. So let's export this back to our location. I'm just going to overwrite this gate piece here. And I'm just going to make it selected and there we go. Okay. 
So in the new mesh folder, I'm not going to overwrite this mesh because it, it honestly wouldn't know how to do that since I generated it in Unreal. So in the mesh folder, I'm just going to import our gate, open it up, import. All right. So here's our gate mesh. We just need to create a quick material for this one. Let's come into our materials. And since I'm not using any textures for this, um, it would obviously look better if I did, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to use any painted textures. I'm just going to create a new material for it. So let's create a new master material and then metal or something like that. Double click to open it. So there's a couple rules when you are working with metals in uh, physically based rendering, which is what Unreal uses. You have to have your luminance level up pretty high um, between like 0.8 and 1. I'm going to put it somewhere at like 0.9 for the base color. I'm going to leave it at white. And then we just need to up this metallic value to make it appear metallic here. So I'm going to hit hold 1 and click to create a scalar value here. And I'm going to set the value to 1. And I'm going to plug that in here, which means that this is going to be fully metallic. So um, same thing to adjust the roughness. I'm just going to hit 1 and click and plug this into the roughness. So now this is a roughness value of 0. We don't want it quite that shiny. So let's try like maybe 0.3. And um, that looks pretty good to me. And obviously, if you came in and did a roughness map with some like dust and scratches, and that would all look much better. But this is perfectly fine for our purposes. And if you were using multiple metals in your uh, in your scene, you could come in here and make these all parameters and make um, make material instances coming off them. So we could change the colors. So, for example, if this is like my basic, most basic metal, it's just sort of a generic silver color. I could come in here and convert this to a parameter. Let's call this base color and maybe even do this one if I wanted to be able to vary the roughness here. So then what I could do from here, after I save all this out, I could come in here and make an instance off of it. And let's say I wanted to make like a, uh, like a, like a bronze or a brass or a gold even. We could come in here, override the base color value and if we give it a little color, as long as we keep the uh, luminance up pretty high, we can give it a color to make it a different type of metal, as an example. So um, for my gate mesh here, I'm just going to give it one of my metallic ones that I just made. Let's give it the basic metal. And um, in the blueprint for it. This is the BP underscore gate. We just need to replace our static mesh with our new one. And there you have it. So if we were to play from over here, let's just make sure it still works. It does. Now there is a bug where if you step on this, uh, it restarts the animation. I'm aware of it. We will fix it in an upcoming video. Uh, but that is all for now.